This podcast is brought to you by patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Head there to check out exclusive podcasts like Talking Futurama, Talk King of the Hill, the What a Cartoon Movie Podcast, and tons more. Cartoons from present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Short but mostly shows. We'll talk, we'll analyze, exploring as we go. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, the podcast that's secretly a trivia off. I'm one of your hosts, the male adolescent power fantasy doll, Bob Mackey. And this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today, as always. Hey, it's Henry Gilbert and Name Thunder are the Barbarian's Allies! We did a podcast about that, we but did. it's not on hand. Yeah. Who is our special guest on the line? It's Professor Gascan, and much like Superman, I never get mad. And this month's episode is all about Welcome to Eltingville. I now call this meeting of the Eltingville comic book, science fiction, horror, fantasy, and role-playing club officially to order. <laughs> And joining us once again is Professor Gascan, a premium patron who chose this as their patron pick. And please let us know, why did you choose this pilot for Welcome to Eltingville? Um, the reason I picked it is just because I had been thinking a lot about, um, I'd been screwing around a lot in this old program called Flashpoint and thinking a lot about kind of geek culture things from around the early aughts. And this really is a huge kind of time capsule of that, kind of the how do I say it? You just kind of had to put more of the work in to be part of the geek kind of subculture because everything is was so much harder to get your hands on back then. And I just I just thought it'd be a lot of fun, fun to look through. And also, it's just one of those fun little adult swim pilots that never stood a chance. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I think it definitely... I was reading these when they were new, the comics first, and, and waiting for this to be released. And I... Definitely think it captures a very specific type of at least American fandom uh, of geeky things of, I'd say, pretty perfectly from 1993 to at least 2002, I'd say. It, it, it All of the right before the internet really becomes a thing vision of geekdom. And of course, I uh, as then and even now, <laughs> I see it as like a painful mirror shown to my face, or let's just say a warning of uh, of what you could be if you're not careful. Yeah, the the comic itself, I think, uh, I guess the uh, spoilers, I suppose. I think it it does end as kind of a, I guess, a more hopeful kind of exploration of what happens when you get out of that sort of mentality at least well it's hopeful and hopeless it's kind of the the finale comic (laughs) is both like here's what could happen if these people grow up and a lot of it's not good but there's a little bit of hope Mm. for one of the guys i'd say or one and a half of the guys (laughs) there's like i have some distance from these characters even though uh it is a dark mirror Mm. (laughs) to my own (laughs) life in some ways but uh this does feel like uh definitely and this is not an astute observation but a real gen x portrayal because when i was watching this it's a 2002 pilot and i was thinking in my head this feels like a period piece from 1994 and then i looked that's when the comic came out right so i was like this feels like a period piece but also that was made 20 years ago looking in the past because none of these guys are on the internet yet Mm -hmm. no in some not in the first uh couple comics but in the later comics they do start going online and there there's jokes about forums there's Bits about a character, um, Josh is really constantly bedeviled by Greedo, uh, Greedo 365, I believe, or 69, one of those numbers. That character is always bugging him on on internet forums. So, I mean, uh, Evan Dorkin is an Xer, so he's writing it. The starting point of the dork vision he has for these characters is from his 70s life, uh, childhood, and 80s too, but... Yeah, I I read this in fall 1999. They appeared in a Wizard magazine backup. Hmm. So uh, so Wizard magazine published them, and and that made me go like, oh, these got this is pretty funny. Hey, I should get into some of these alternative comics instead of just reading Marvel, DC, 
or some vertigo and then like i think sin city and madman which both uh madman which both appear in this cartoon uh in little easter eggs those were the only alternative books i was reading but then i really got into dorkin's dork comics uh, i'm actually wearing a dork shirt today of the hmm. uh of uh, the devil hand puppet uh, he did lots of stuff, which I really enjoy. Like Milk and Cheese is a lot of fun, too. But Yeah, speaking of Wizard Magazine, that's how I found out about him. And Milk and Cheese were all over that magazine. Mm-hmm. I think the editors just really liked him in Milk and Cheese as fun little mascots. <laughs> they're, they're fun drunk guys who beat up shit. Like, they're just violent, mean assholes, which he loves. He talks about how, like, Milk and Cheese is hard for him to write now, too, because it's like... It's like a punk band trying to write punk stuff in their fifties. <laughs> They're just like, ah, I don't, I don't have my youthful energy anymore. <laughs> well, like that punk guy who tried to start the winery and he had like the bacon flavored wine or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Henry Rollins has done the smart thing of like, no, I just talk places mm-hmm. now. Same with Jello Biafra. <laughs> That's don't try to sing songs anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I read them through their many sporadic appearances from '99 onward up to their 2015 finale comic uh which really it hit me in this gut every time and even when i thought in 2015 when i read that finale comic and thought well i've grown out of this this isn't a dark (laughs) mirror to me anymore (laughs) specifically the character of josh who i do have the most in common with not not just that (laughs) i've always had weight issues but also that he he seems like the angriest or the uh, anyway the point is though that i saw that his character in the future was working for the online comics press and hoping to break into (laughs) the world of comics. And I was like, as I read that while working for a video game website, I was like, (laughs) oh, shit. (laughs) <laughs> Evan Dorkin gets me again, that guy, man. Yeah, when learning about their futures, uh, while watching the show, I was like, oh, Jerry has a level head, and it turns out, you know, spoilers, he does end up with the best uh, future. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, But I did have friends... I was the Josh in my group. I had a friend. I'm not going to name them, but I had a I had a friend who was very similar to Bill. I had a friend who was very <laughs> similar to Jerry. I've known many Pete's in my life. Like the Pete's are the guys who had the drugs in the group. Like the rest of us were too much of nerds <laughs> to be like, I'll get in trouble. But or the one guy with a girlfriend. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or the- and who later turns into his uh, the mother of his child that he's a deadbeat dad. On. <laughs> this actually yeah. was kind of painful to watch because uh, I never had a, a nerd group really. There weren't enough of these nerds in my area to form a group. It was usually just like one or two friends. And for about I don't know like six or seven years, I was friends with a guy who was disturbingly like Josh. Mm. He had real anger issues. And while I laughed at the boys all, like, fighting each other, it also made me remember that this guy, when he was losing an argument, he would just punch you. And at one point, he strangled me, and I realized, I'm 19 years old, we're adults, I can't be friends with this person because he might murder me. (laughs) Jesus. And yeah, he looks just like this guy, he would explode just like this guy, he had a lot of problems, and I'm happy to be very far away from this person, but I was like, well, this is just, I'm seeing him in this cartoon, and I hate him so much still. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) I never knew any people quite like that, though. The other thing about being a geek at that point is you kind of, which the show also gets, is that you kind of had to take who you could get before, like, really the internet and kind of social media becoming as accessible as as it is now. You couldn't find other, like, more even-tempered niche people to get in a group with. Well, that's the wonderful thing I think they capture, too, in so many, uh, Dorkin captures in so many of the comics, which is, all these guys hate each other like and are all have various like mental health issues that cause them to like uh treat each other like shit but also they have literally no one else to hang out with they have no one else to to be around so they just go like i i had with my friend group there were num- numerous times where I went, well maybe i'm never gonna talk to you again fuck you and then you know two days later you're like well who am i gonna watch the batman movie with you know yes. alone <laughs> like no. with with that josh style friend i think there were like five friend breakups that mm. were quickly amended because we were like we have no one else to hang out with <laughs> Uh, though though actual physical altercations didn't really happen mm. in my friends group uh, hey i didn't hit back because i know he would probably kill me <laughs> yes, so yeah, yeah. i was mostly a punching bag <laughs> but yeah and i also recall uh, as a, as a fan of dorkins that i knew when this pilot was being worked on i would in the early days of the internet or just on uh, in the books like wizard any piece of news of like oh they're working on the pilot it's going to be something 
but also that amount of knowledge knew that by the time it actually aired when i was out of high school i also knew it would uh it wouldn't get another episode like that was the that was the depressing part about it once it finally aired but yeah their uh production budget exceeded 300 dollars, so don't <laughs> swim certainly wasn't gonna pick it up union people in burbank what the nah, well uh, we'll we'll get to that but uh but i guess uh for our history section here Really, this entire thing wouldn't exist without Evan Dorkin, so let's talk about him. The Eisner-winning comic artist and screenwriter was born in 1965, coming of age just as nerd culture really crystallized and was defined in America. He was the generation of Star Wars, D&D, Bruce Lee, Grindhouse films, and the fuzzy time where the Silver Age of comics was starting to become the Bronze Age, but... He really got into Marvel as a kid just as the Silver Age was was ending as we knew it. And he was a big Marvel kid who later got into DC books. But as a kid, Marvel number one, just like me. Baby. <laughs> and he quickly became a fan of all of those things, befriending similar fanboys, especially in Staten Island, where he moved to at the age of 13 and apparently still lives there to this day. Uh, which he even says, like, I can't believe I still live in Staten Island. <laughs> hey, but, low cost of living. <laughs> it's true. You know, those the, the checks for those uh, TV scripts go a lot farther in Staten Island than in L.A., I bet. That does explain Pete's accent when yep. I read that fact about him. Yep, yep. All these kids should be talking like that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> wait, wait. how old are these guys? They're out of high school, right? Uh, I, think yeah. they're, I think they're freshmen high school. In it. They really? Talk, they're that young? There's, there's, there's they don't a, look that young. Oh, you know what? It's senior because uh, in the first story... They talk about it's their prom night, so okay. I think you should read them as senior. They're forever seniors until he decides to age them up in the in the last comic. The, the so. way I read it is that they were just right out of high school and just very aimless and not knowing what to do. <laughs> yeah, that's how I saw them, too. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, he was uh, super into all that stuff, and then he started working at a comic book store, even. He worked at one on and off for six years. And unlike the comic shop in this episode and in the comic, uh, it actually was a good comic book store. It's called Jim Hanley's U Hanley's Universe in Staten Island. And it's where he learned a deeper love of comic book things. Like, I get the sense that his boss was the reverse of Joe in this uh, comic where he taught him a deeper love of comics and that comics goes beyond Marvel and DC. It's where he got super into the spirit and a lot of the new alternative comics that were getting big in the 80s, uh, especially Love and Rockets, and that really influenced him uh, to become an artist himself. Now, uh, here's how he describes his own youth in the Eltingville comic collection that explains where he was drawing from in this. Quote, The arguments, the pettiness, the obsessiveness, the fighting, that's all based on us and our idiocy, swelled to epic proportions by my years of observing subcultures as a fan, comic shop employee, and comic industry professional. My friends and I played Dungeons and Dragons the night of my prom. I stalked a supermarket, tearing open packages of Wonder Bread to try to get all the Battlestar Galactica trading cards. <laughs> I had a sporadic shoplifting career as a teenager, which included boosting comics, model kits, plastic soldiers, role-playing miniatures, and Star Wars action figures. My friends and I often talked the stupid talk and walked the stupid walk. So he's uh, he's saying he's the real deal. Like he, a lot of the stuff in the comics, I was like, boy, this is so specific. It has to be autobiographical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that would explain why the character he's voicing is stealing a bunch of stuff in one of the scenes. <laughs> yep, yep, that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah, and it works at the comic book store too. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, Dorkin uh, is Jewish as well. And so I think the the specifically like uh, Josh Levi calling other people anti-Semitic or or he said <laughs> that he, you know, he saw a lot of anti-Semitism in his youth in Staten Island because uh, he didn't, quote unquote, look Jewish. And so he would hear a lot of horrible shit from people. Which... And we're, we're kind of skirting over it with a name like Dorkin. Yeah. You have to become a comic book artist yes, and writer, right? Yes, yes, it's true. His name is Dorkin. The it's word Dork true. is in his name. It's true. And he never changed <laughs> Yeah, it. Some, some paths are just chosen for you. <laughs> Uh, and so he grew as an artist, self-taught at first, and he also got super into punk and ska music, as, as I'm sure you could guess from the, uh, the soundtrack of this cartoon. Then Dorkin went to college, uh, though he never graduated. First went to the School of Visual Arts and then NYU. Uh, oh, and also 
Dorkin was a child of a single mom who was divorced. So Bill Dickey's stuff with his divorced mom in the comic, I think, is is pulled a little from there, too. But he 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 loves his mom. He isn't screaming at her all the time <laughs> or robbing her. But but yeah, so he goes to school of visual arts in NYU first training in animation because he was a big fan of Ralph Bakshi's work. Don't worry. He super hates Ralph Bakshi today. He just he, <laughs> he liked his stuff when he was a teen. But ultimately, while working in animation, he realized comics is where his heart truly lied. As he entered into comics professionally, uh, he has a funny story about his first two pro gigs. Two of my earliest gigs were drawing dirty comics for Penthouse Hot Talk magazine hmm. and doing storyboard cleanup on the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wow. That just about sums up my career pretty well, running the gamut all over the place. From porn to turtles. Yes. And sometimes both at once in today's climate. He had a funny, uh, yeah, that would be his job now, but he, he had a funny bit too of saying that like his mom actually respected his porn work more than the funny book stuff because huh. she's just like, well, yeah, that's penthouse. That's that's a real job. Like she was not approved. And so she was just like, yeah, that's a real job. That porno company is going to pay you, honey. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it was also around this time as he was growing as an artist while still working at a comic shop, he got to know and collaborate with Queens-based artist Stephen DeStefano, uh, who would leave comics in the early 90s to do animation full-time. He worked on some of the early Spumco, Ren and Stimpies, and fucking hated John Kay, thought he was <laughs> a piece of shit and quit the show before John Kay got fired. And then he's one of the guys that Bob Camp was like, hey, John Kay's gone. Do you want to come back and work on games? Ren and He's like, hell yeah. Yeah, there were a few people like that. Uh, Chris Riccardi. Yeah. Uh, he was fired because he was dating John Kay's ex. Yep. Yeah. And then he came back to games and did some great work there. De Stefano said he learned so much from Camp and Riccardi and uh, Bob Ray or uh, Bill Ray as well. De Stefano would also work on Two Stupid Dogs, the Warner Brothers or Kids WB Batman and Superman cartoons, which really put him in a good place 10 years later when Dorkin uh, and him cross paths once more. But De Stefano, uh, I think, learned a lesson sooner than Dorkin of like, boy, as, as horrible as the animation industry is, comics treat you far worse and you get even less money. But Dorkin got his big break while as a manager at that comic shop, he made a connection with future Deadpool co-creator Fabian Nicchiesa, uh, who was an editor of Marvel's kids line of comic books. And Dorkin, he thought, would be great as the writer and penciler of the Bill and Ted comic. And he did 12 whole issues of that until he said he he quit out of some like uh, petty thing with Marvel. <laughs> And he also drew a Predator comic. Like, he was doing all this mainstream stuff. Plus, he was also doing... Uh, this was something... For, in my brief time of, of getting into punk music, I noticed that he did these um, covers for ska compilation albums called American Scothic. And every time I looked at them, I was like, wait, that's Evan Dorkin. Holy shit. He, I didn't know he was, that's how, how much he was into ska. Yeah, American ska, thank Jesus. Hey, it hey would, the pun is just sitting there. Someone had to use it. It wouldn't be a ska <laughs> compilation if it didn't have some sort of dumb pun in it. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, he was growing and growing as well in the world of alternative comics. In 1989, he created Milk and Cheese, a pair of violent living dairy products that worked as an outlet for his frustrations with the modern world, such as him. One of my favorite milk and cheese lines is when they're in a movie theater and a baby starts crying. And he's like, why well, who takes your fucking baby to the movies? Your baby doesn't want to watch a movie. You're fucking babies. Get the fuck out of they're here. They're saying what we're all thinking. Yes. Yeah. Those two. <laughs> they also said gin makes a man mean, which uh, I think is, is true. It's, I always think of gin as the meanest of liquors, so. <laughs> uh, but as opposed to the brownest of liquors. Yeah. Those, those just make you wistful, I think. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes. And it was around the same time that Dorkin met, fellow comic artist Sarah Dyer, uh, an art school graduate who was working in comics and zines, a lot with a feminist vibe to them, uh, Action Girl Comics, Mad Planet. She liked collaborating a lot with a lot of female comic artists in the then very male and shitty indie comic scene, which I think is only uh, slightly less male and shitty now thanks to a lot of online stuff allowing way fewer gatekeepers on that stuff. But... I really respect Dyer for making some way in comics as like an openly feminist uh, comic artist in the indie world where you also like make no money. So you make no money and everybody treats you like shit because you're the one woman there. 
but she and Dorkin uh, connected very quickly, both artistically and romantically. They're still married to this day. Hmm. And uh. pretty much they work together on all of the, even on the stuff where they're not credited together. They're a married couple who are both creators. So they both say like, oh yeah, I ran this by him or he, she ran this, I ran this by her, that kind of thing. They, they always are working together. But where did the Eltingville Club come from, to be specific? Well, it all started in the first half of 1994 because Dorkin, who was publishing his comics at the company Slave Labor Graphics, which let's just call it SLG. That's pretty much what they just go by <laughs> now. Look, it was I don't a, like that whole slave part. It was a funny pun in 1989, guys, you know. But uh, anyway, so at SLG, his publisher, Dan Vado, was also a writer for Justice League. Uh, he And so uh, he got to see from Dan Vado's perspective what happened when in Justice League Task Force number 14, beloved team member Ice was killed and Dan Vado got so much hate, full on death threats and other hate mail because they killed off Ice. And what's even more ironic is that the Ice character who got killed off was actually not even by Vado. His co-writer on the other book, Mark Wade, was the one who chose to kill Ice. And he's the one who was like, years later, took the blame for it. He's like, yeah, I shouldn't have killed Ice. It was <laughs> dumb. I just wanted an easy an easy way to get people's attention. And so Vado is getting all this hate mail when he didn't even kill off the character. That reminds me of, uh, uh, we know someone who wrote a video game review that uh, made a lot of people mad. But the line that made everyone mad wasn't even their own writing. It was an editor that put that in there. I, I know the one you're talking yes. about. Yep. Yeah. It's, I'm not using any pronouns or no, names or no. uh, outlets or anything. But that's, I mean, isn't that the worst when it's like, but I didn't even write them. My editor edited this into my thing. Like, <laughs> uh, at least be mad at me a thing I did. But so Dorkin got to see what happened to Dan Vado and he was like, this is dog shit. Like, who are these people that... And this is back when you had to write and stamp a letter to send to DC mm -hmm. Comics in 1994. You put anything you want in there. Any kind of powders or yeah. uh, substances. <laughs> Any kind of electronic devices. <laughs> uh, and so when Dorkin saw all that stuff, he imagined... Who could possibly be the people who are writing these things? Who is doing this? And so that sprung to mind his vision of the Eltingville comic book, science fiction, fantasy, horror, and role-playing club uh, with leads Bill Dickey, Josh Levy, Pete D'Annunzio, and Jerry Stokes that he then published as part of an anthology comic called instant piano by dark horse in 1994 which steven de stefano had his own comic in that as well and his was the standout comic in that people really liked it i think because fans either laughed with familiarity or they cringed because they recognized too much of themselves in it <laughs> uh and dorkin as well was kind of he even says he was spurred on because it got hate mail from those types of fans. We're like, how dare you mock us? And he was like, boy, I know I did something right here. Like he was so happy he made those people mad. And pretty much the first comic that gets adapted into the first five minutes of this. Uh, well, actually, I'd say minute three through six of this episode is the first comic. And then in 95, he writes two more short stories, including Bring Me the Head of Boba Fett, which would win Dorkin his first of five Eisner Awards. Mm. He's a five-time Eisner Award winner. You should marry an Eisner Award winner. <laughs> which, which he, <laughs> Take my advice. Well, they, and they, they're a married couple of Eisner Award oh, winners. I've got to win one now. Yeah, years now. But, but. I need the, uh, <laughs> uh, the podcast equivalent. The Rogan. Oh, God, yes. I, yes. Sw I swept the Rogans this year. <laughs> Oh, uh, Mark Barron should be doing these awards yeah. to say it for. Uh, I'll never yeah. kill as many people as Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> you have to settle for whatever the silver medal is. What is that? The Neil Young Award? Uh, <laughs> the Corolla. The Cor oh, yeah, Corolla. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the, but his comics, uh, the Eltingville comics, were some of the standouts of his work, though not the only thing he did. He pretty much would do like one or two every year or so. But he kind of had this sporadically, like every few months, he would publish a comic called Dork, which was basically just whatever short stories he wanted to put in it and and other dedicated stuff too. Dork was my favorite one. I love Dork. Every, it was so packed full of comic jokery. Like some pages had like 
21 panel jokes in them even i also think it's making you a walking target to be a comic book nerd walking around reading a book called dork it's true it's like i'm yes. at the bus stop reading dork <laughs> So just as the Eltingville comics were getting going, Dorkin and Dyer were hired for their very first TV job and their big break came from Mike Lazo of uh, the future Adult Swim uh, runner of it, I guess, executive producer. Mike Lazo really enjoyed his milk and cheese comics and he was like, we're looking for people to write Space Ghost episodes. Can you do that? And Dorkin and Dyer were like, hell yeah, we can. So they wrote some of the um, second year of Space Ghost episodes. Do you remember one with Danny Bonaducci and Branford Marsalis? Mm. That's uh, they wrote that one. I do remember. What a pair! Do you remember the one where Zorak is uh, demanding Jack Klugman to be on the show? Hmm. That's uh, Dorkin and Dyer as well, and that really opened the door for them uh, to not work outside of comic books. Now, while both were still working a lot on comics. They got hired next to work on the Superman animated series in the first year. They wrote several episodes. Their big highlight was they wrote uh, the really great episode that was animated by TMS, oh, cool. uh, the Livewire debut one, which was really like their big. If there's any character that you would call the Harley Quinn of the Superman animated series, I think it's Livewire. Not just that she is a cute petite girl in the Bruce Tim style, but. But also that she was a breakout character who then transitioned into the regular comics and has appeared in stuff uh, even in the Supergirl cartoons. Was Livewire before or after Tank Girl because they're voiced by the same actress? It's after Tank Girl, but yeah, I think uh, they they, Lori Petty, I believe, did it because of Tank Girl. Tank Girl, eh? That gives me an idea. (laughs) Uh, Livewire is great, and I I think they get some modest character payments on that. There's That's something, too, I really like about Dorkin, that he is is uh he is a bridge burner type guy who also just says like yeah here's exactly how much dc pays me for x y or z like he and i think that transparency is needed in comics but that also doesn't make him a ton of friends in a lot of comic companies uh yeah those companies really hate that especially now (laughs) oh yeah yep it's bad enough when you look bad within the comics world but if you embarrass them in like hollywood reporter or entertainment weekly then they're really bad (laughs) uh but yeah so they write on the superman cartoon dorkin and dyer also wrote on batman beyond they did the splicers episode of the first season of that and uh, with all that professional animation work coming together it's now 1999 and mike lazo and keith crawford are revving up what will become adult swim and they're looking for pilots. And so they offer to a, him the chance to adapt Eltingville into a cartoon show. And Dorkin says, he said yes as fast as he could. And then was like, oh, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> so basically for a year, he and Dyer worked very, very hard on the series. He wrote the script. He and Dyer developed uh, the show Bible, character models, backgrounds, props, color guide. Dorkin in 2015 was like, my biggest regret is I did not delegate half as much as I should have. Like, he did did too much work. I was surprised to see his name as a layout artist on this. Yes, yeah. (laughs) I'm surprised he didn't do all the storyboards either. That's the one thing he said, like, in the 2015 uh, retrospective on it, he said... The one thing I wasn't was crazy enough to try to storyboard it myself. And I hired my friend Steven DiStefano <laughs> to board it for me. I, I guess in a way he kind of already did uh, storyboard it because a lot of this is based on comics he drew. Yes. Yeah. And of yeah. course, there's more that goes into it than just tracing the panels and putting them on a storyboard sheet. But a big thing for them in adapting the character models was that Dorkin is a very detailed artist. Like he loves drawing like every crevice of a zit on a character's face. Yeah. And then you just can't do that. Same with like Bill normally wears plaid bill can't wear plaid in this cartoon it would be too much line density his art reminds me a lot of another uh, another jewish cartoonist named eli valley yeah he does absolutely hideous uh caricatures of people absolutely like when he goes to the big like josh face that he draws later it's like oh oh yeah that's <laughs> eli valley face. i was also thinking of uh peter bag when watching yeah. this they're all of a similar ilk their designs and i think for the most part too ugly to be uh, accepted by a tv viewing audience <laughs> although there is a really good hate pilot i don't like the voice of buddy in that but it could have been an mtv show so check that out. i think rough drafted it it's what killed mission hill as well to trying to look like that yeah <laughs> uh well actually it was just indifferent warner executives and the success of buffy the vampire slayer that killed uh, that show daniel klaus was in hot 
not yet. It was it, unlike <laughs> uh, just uh, what Ghost World would just be 2001, wouldn't it? The the movie Ghost World, mm-hmm. I should say. Yeah, uh, where the the rare time, very very briefly, uh, Thora Birch was more famous than Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> like she was the the bigger name in that movie, top billing. But yeah, so as also they were working on it too, they decided they weren't going to do the South Park thing. If you read the comics, they say the F word every other word in it, like which which is realistic for that group of guys. They would do that. And they would, if you think they're hateful towards women in this cartoon, uh, it's times 80 in the <laughs> comics, which again, realistic. But a choice they made was they didn't want to do the South Park thing of just having them say like, fuck you, fucker, and, and bleeping it. So they're like, yeah, I'll just write PG-13 and try to make it mean while not being R-rated. That that was a choice they made. It works better for that. And uh, De Stefano uh, boarded it in the 22-minute pilot style. Uh, it's very distracting, even on the Adult Swim website, where it's like, oh, here's where the ad goes. It's like, the ad should not go there. This is a three-act adult sitcom cartoon. Mm. This is not a two-act ad- uh, Adult Swim cartoon. They also knew they couldn't direct it themselves, and they hired. They got a great hire as the pilot director, Chuck Sheets of uh, Simpsons and King of the Hill veteran. Based on his credits in a timeline, I think he squeezed this in between his last stuff on the Recess series for Disney before going back to Simpsons for I'm Going to Praise Land. Oh, wow. I think uh, that's when he worked on this. Yeah, the animation quality on this surprised me. I thought it was going to be a bit stiffer, but a lot of work went into this. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's shockingly good for being an Adult Swim pilot. I mean, that's why probably why it didn't get to be a series. Yes. Yeah. Not, not, to, not to steal your fire, <laughs> not, Henry. Not to spoil it, but yeah. Just looking but... at one one minute of this i'm like well yeah this is uh venture brothers looks like aqua teen compared to this yeah like venture brothers now is almost as good looking as this pilot is yeah uh but dorkin and dyer they also cast the, all the voices and directed them it was a lot of relative unknowns though uh not unknown to uh comedy nerds oh yeah because you've got jason harris's bill who was then the host of double dare 2000 And actually, most of his credits now for Harris are as a VO casting producer, which says to me he owns his own recording studio. That's what it says to me. Yeah, my own recording studio. He polishes and dusts mixing boards. (laughs) And then you've got Troy Metcalf as Josh, who I think is great. And he is a big boy himself, Troy. Uh, He played the character... Troy on Strangers with Candy, who was the uh, a heavy the heavy lad who was friends with, uh, who who would sometimes make fun of uh, Jerry Blank. On yeah, the show. he wasn't a big character, which is I was shocked to see him uh, a voice on this. The one joke I remember is he walks by Jerry and he goes, "Hey Jerry, eat this," and she eats it, and, she, and she's like, "What was that?" He goes, "A scab," <laughs> and she goes, "Scab." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also apparently spent a decade on that TV show, The Middle, which I'm mm. like, oh, good for him, you know. And then, of course, the big star from Strangers with Candy, Lark Spees. Spears? Spees. Spees. Lark yes. Spees is Pete. Uh, he was Derek, the uh, the brother who was called f- a lot of versions of the word fag. Stepbrother. By, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not brother. Yeah. There was some sexual tension between uh, him and Jerry. Uh, yeah. He, <laughs> you know, and then soon after this, he wouldn't be cast in the movie because they said he had grown up too much and looked like a longshoreman and he could not pass <laughs> as, as a teen anymore. I'm, I'm, so, what an I'm so mad at that movie. I'll, yeah. I'll never not be mad at that movie. <laughs> and uh, And Jerry is played by Corey Bill who played some guy named Pete in four episodes of Walking Dead, and that's like his most famous thing. And, of course, you can't hear the voice in the, one voice in this without instantly knowing that's MC Chris as Willoughby the Wannabe. Everybody loved MC Chris back then. Yeah, his voice is great, and we talked about him in like a recent Aqua Teen, I think, or the, the um, C-Lab. C-Lab episode, yeah. yeah. And it was around this time he was just leaving Adult Swim. Uh, he would he would not be there for much longer because he was like, well, I'm not making any money and I'm not selling any pilots or anything. I'm just going to go work on music. And that's what he did. He was very successful. I wonder, did this uh, cartoon influence his classic Boba Fett song? I, I think it was that. out before that. Oh, okay. Well, then it should this it should have <laughs> been on this thing then instead of in the uh, Aqua Team. That should have been C-Lab. the backing track during the trivia off. Yeah. Uh, and Dorkin himself voices Iron Jaw. And uh, yes, they also got their pals, the Aquabats, the ska band to write the opening and the ending of the series. I think it was a mistake to not have the lyrics at the beginning. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, so, it's the reverse of South Park. The South Park credit song 
is the original song Primus Road and then they were told no make it more upbeat and have lyrics that should be the uh, the the opening to South Park I mean when it first debuted this is more the reverse they're like uh no no words in the in the opening and then we'll just have words over the credits yeah it should should be reversed I think so too animation was done out of the cartoon network studios in burbank again uh, pretty rare for our early adult swim shows or even current adult swim shows actually which i think is another reason uh it didn't continue but overseas animation was done by japan's tama productions tama is mainly a support studio for companies like tms and walt disney animation japan Though they did do some full episodes of uh what a cartoon subjects like bonkers goof troop gargoyles and Darkwing Duck, and they unsadly closed in 2011. But yeah, this is like a quality. This isn't the A team of Japanese overseas studios, but this is also like not as cheap as as it could have been back hmm. then. I don't know if you have in your notes, Henry, the other pilots that were airing around this time. Do you have that? Oh, why not? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of them was uh, Saddle Rash, which was a uh, soup to nuts or whatever the home movies production right, companies right. was, which is like a cowboy without uh, arms and legs, I think. Right. That was it. And also one people really hated was the Groovinians. Oh. And these were all 2002 pilots on, car- on for Adult Swim. There was also the John K. Jetsons, I think, was in that pack of them, too, I think. This was easily the best, and they they worked on it so long and hard, and, and through 9-11, they were even working on it. <laughs> so they are working on it from 99 through 2000. In October 2001, Evan Dorkin is at a con and goes like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all done, waiting for it to air. But I think the die had already been cast at that point, uh, but... But yes, nerds like me were waiting for any information when it would finally air. I was watching Adult Swim over and over again and and loving it, but thinking, you know, when's that Eltingville show going to premiere? I didn't know the distinction between a pilot and a full series Mm -hmm. then. The weird thing Adult Swim didn't do, what Cartoon Network did, is Cartoon Network, they would have these pilots, but then you would vote on the one you wanted to see. And they were doing that like even 10 years beyond the airing of this pilot. I don't know why they didn't ask the audience or maybe the internet was around enough for them to gauge interest based on message board posts and things like that. I was definitely busy in the forums when it debuted on March 3rd, 2002. Like I was, I was like, come on, I hope they make more of it. And then you'd have the other Eltingville style know-it-alls going like, don't you know it's already canceled? They'd have to be producing it now. (laughs) Which like, uh, which it takes nine months to make one of these. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Well, that, (laughs) A secret of Adult Swim that if you're a Venture Brothers fan, you quickly learn is that <laughs> once Adult Swim greenlights something for production, you're waiting two years for that thing to be done. And then once it's done, then Adult Swim's like, now we should decide to renew it or not. And then you got to wait. another. It's why uh, Rick and Morty took forever. The only reason they are having more consistent releases now, they did just renew it for 70 episodes at once, which... I wish they'd do Adventure Brothers instead of canceling it and then just deciding to do a movie. But uh, And that same kind of heartbreak came to Eltingville because while Dorkin did a ton of press in March 2002 when it debuted, teasing like, oh, we got all these plans for future episodes, all these great ideas. Dorkin says it debuted one night on Adult Swim. He, he joked that it was seen by more people than all his comics combined had been <laughs> read. read there. Uh, but that he said that uh, it was rerun a few times and it would get, you know, okay ratings, but it just wasn't going to be worked on. And uh, Dorkin certainly has some regrets. So he, one, he never says on the record why it didn't go to series because he doesn't know. But also I think he doesn't want to be like, surprisingly Dorkin burns a lot of bridges, but I don't think he wants to be Hmm. too mean to the guys who took a chance on him. Yeah. I think they were never going to pay for this. And I don't even know how the pilot was made outside of Mm -hmm. them liking him a lot, because there was no way this level of animation could have made it on adult swim that early. like uh, Rick and Morty is really the first traditionally animated outsource show really. Right. Yeah. On on that level. I mean, venture brothers is similar, but it's not on the level of like a broadcast TV cartoon, like Rick and Morty is. Titmouse on venture brothers was doing it the cheaper way. Yeah. You know, and recently, interestingly enough, the uh, darling hit smiling friends that's actually was made on the same budget as aqua teen hunger force as it turns out. Wow. I didn't know that. I, I, I'm, I've seen some clips. I'm waiting for (laughs) smiling friends. 
friends. It's coming on HBO Max this oh, week. Good. So I do want I do want to finally see it. I guess they're paying more than just Clay Croker and, and whipping him. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, think if they could only make one of these, it was cool that they were able to adapt all these Eisner winning comics. But I also think it could have been a better pilot. Oh well, no, Dorkin agrees with you, okay. Bob. He uh, this is what he said on one of his regrets. He says, "Quote." That's the one we adapted into a pilot, which was probably a mistake on my part. I think it made people think that it was just going to be four guys yelling trivia questions at each other. I still to this day don't know why the pilot failed. I have ideas, but I don't know what they didn't like about it. So, yeah, yeah. Even he's like, it was such a hit comic in the small world of comics but he's like why was it four minutes of guys yelling trivia at each other <laughs> yeah it does feel like a series of sketches and it's you know very well animated and the voice acting is great and the music is good but i feel like a proper pilot would have had uh you know more of a full story across three acts and i really think even though these guys are made a lot less mean than they are in the comics I really feel like one of them needs to be the point of view character because even on Aqua Teen, Frylock is the normal guy. Like on Seinfeld, Seinfeld is relatively normal. But then later over time, you deconstruct them and say, well, they're actually, they're as messed up as everyone else. And you're a fool to think that they're the normal one. But th you're still like such an outsider in this world of these vicious, awful nerds <laughs> uh, when you're watching. Unless you're one of those vicious, awful nerds, but then you're offended. They're like, how dare you be so correct about me? But so yeah, Dorkin won't say why. Uh, and yes, you've you've thrown out several of the my guesses too. Of like, one my educated guess is that it was way higher budget than all the other shows. Also, that it was the only one produced out of Cartoon Network Studios in Burbank. All the rest were done through the William Street atlanta much cheaper non-union way of doing it i'd say conservatively this is like a three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand dollar pilot and i think on that c lab they said they had like a budget of thirty thousand an episode right so already it's like 10 times more than a william street show costs right it's a whole season of aqua Teen, basically yeah and what i also think that lazo i don't want to give the executives a pass for being cheap but i do get the sense especially in the early years of adult swim that the guys above Lazo were not, were just, once they saw the budget for things like Eltingville, they're like, we're not giving you regular Cartoon Network budget for this. Like, this probably won't be as successful as a Dexter or Powerpuff Girls, so you don't get Dexter or Powerpuff Girls money. And though the sad thing is, once Adult Swim proved it was as popular as those, and, so, and in a lot of cases, more popular... They didn't get more money and they didn't get a bigger budget. They're just like, oh, actually, we like the profit margins <laughs> on how cheap this shit is. Uh, though I th did have a theory, one more that I didn't see floated around. But an important thing, I think, is that, you know, who owns the rights to Eltingville? Not Warner Brothers or Adult Swim. It's Evan Dorkin. That's why Eltingville continued in the comics. Part of the deal, he did not sell the rights to the characters to make the pilot. So... If I try to imagine myself as an asshole Turner executive, I think this costs way more than the other shows. We don't even own it. It won't be made for like uh, another year. And it stars a bunch of unlikable jerks. Why am I paying for this? <laughs> like it, it all makes sense. I understand. I'm, I'm sad. And I think they would have really grown even more with the, the plans they had for making it a regular sitcom. You know, you barely see her in the pilot, but, uh, jane his sister uh bill's sister she was going to be a bigger part of the show like the one girl character the the comics never really had a recurring gir girl character because they hate women and they would never be and they're scared of them so why would a woman be in the comic but jane dickey i thought was a good idea of a character she was supposed to be a horror super fan who knows just as much as them but because she's a girl and bill's little sister they all underestimate her hmm. But yeah, so the pilot, it did fine enough. It would re-air from time to time. You can even get it from a special order DVD from Cartoon Network. It was like kind of partnered with Perfect Hair Forever and, and other oddities. I think that was the Adult Swim in a Box That's DVD. One, yeah. yeah. But it does still live streaming officially on the Adult Swim website. You could play it right now and, and also watch a bunch of like ads for buying a car online or something <laughs> yeah it must have been a real kick in the nuts for dorkin that it didn't get picked up i will say at least it was an early pilot that didn't get picked up as mm. opposed to something like say korgoth which i feel like all <laughs> the ads for that were just kind of pretending like oh we made this special one episode thing for you what isn't that great isn't that nice of us oh uh, yeah speaking of korgoth that's the other thing that would happen a few years later where it's like well you're not you're not ever going to spend this much money right now nope. on a series boy that's a great pilot <laughs> Uh, Check out our old episode about it. That was a good one. Yeah. I 
Uh, but yeah, so uh, for the next decade, I do think Dorkin's faced a lot of heartbreak in his professional life that he's he's written a lot about. I would think this is probably, you know, up there for him. It's like, this was your big shot. And then, well, it didn't happen. What do you do then? <laughs> well, you go back to doing comics and uh, struggle to pay the bills. But not that he's he's been a very successful comic artist since then. Well, creatively very successful. I don't want to say he's like rich, but... For the next decade, he would sporadically do Eltingville stories along with all of his other work. But by 2012 and 2015, he decided he would write the final one and then the epilogue comic. And why did he end it? Well, I've got one more quote from Dorkin here. These days, Eltingville seems less and less like a ludicrous exaggeration and more like a very sad and unfortunate way of life for some people. Every day, the internet provides grist for the Eltingville mill. It's overwhelming and more than a little depressing. It's not that funny anymore. And so, yeah, the uh, the final comic ages them up to adulthood, to the age they'd be today if they had aged since uh, they were teens in 94. And yeah, it just shows you the what what is the future for those mega dweebs? Well, one of them still lives at home with his mom and is like an awful monster. One becomes a uh, comic press <laughs> dude who hopes to start working for DC. One is a guy who uses his horror connections and start working for a horror porno company, which he abuses in a casting couch style in a hateful way. And one actually became a kind of good guy who just like, yeah, I just became like really good at magic cards. And I, I actually have a healthy relationship with a woman I date. <laughs> He's uh, gamers are the strongest morally yes, out of all of us. It's true. The <laughs> well, gamer the, won. And the thing is though, he kind of leaves the craziness behind, but he doesn't stop enjoying this media is the thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Jerry recognizes this is a toxic relationship and we're all toxic people, but I can still enjoy this stuff in my own way without being a hateful monster online. You know, Dorkin talked about why he wanted to end this. And, you know, this kind of toxic fandom was just kept under the floorboards in the 90s and around this time. But now it's everywhere to the point where uh, media now just addresses toxic fans constantly. And I, I'll quote uh, Chris Cabin from We Hate Movies. And he said, popular entertainment is now customer service. Like, oh, you didn't like that ending? Uh, we're going to make up for it in the next movie. Uh, uh, oh, I, I, like Rise of Skywalker is the customer service movie. It's like all the things you hated about Last Jedi, we fixed them. From what I hear, that Boba Fett show was like the customer service Star Wars show. It's just like, yeah, we know. Here's more Mandalorian. You're excited for that guy, right? I mean, yeah. I, I like the Spider-Man No Way Home, but it is customer service. It's like Andrew Garfield, he's going to redeem himself. You know, you hated those movies. We're going to make up for it. And it's because these fans get their way every time and it's not funny anymore yeah yeah when, when i'm not he, looking at you or pointing at you Henry. hey i I'm not, i don't feel personally attacked here <laughs> no look i i know i well and same with like he quit eltingville in 2015 he didn't even know how much worse it would get yeah like, that's like one year stuff. after uh, gamergate yeah and he, i saw him like mention gamergate in terms of talking about these characters like these are the guys and he'd be doing it and he was already seeing the reaction to the uh the new goes the then and new ghostbusters which is now the old new ghostbusters which like you said the afterlife was supposed to be the answer to that like oh is that like, like the customer service thing of oh you didn't like that what we got all the old guys back and they're themselves and even the dead guys back <laughs> even like, the dead one showed up <laughs> we'll make him do uh, this the, i was just gonna say about the gamergate thing i actually was on the ground floor of that not as a participant at all but just kind of as an observer fun thing the guy who started it first posted because it was the whole screed he had posted he posted it first on something awful uh which i was a member then he got that thread got him banned immediately he posted it on 4chan they also told him to fuck off and uh, of course he found a whole cadre of credulous fucking morons on reddit then. yeah yeah i mean uh, henry so, and i were in the games uh, press then and it sucked uh, i mean the people doing it were bad but i think Almost as bad as everyone we worked with who was like, let's not get involved. Yes, yeah. And in a way, that is customer service. Like, we're not going to make our readers mad, yeah, are we? Uh, taking sides. Yeah. That's not... It's more uh, of a he yeah. said, she said thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard yeah, that a few times for people I used to respect. Yep. The thing about it, which uh, not a lot of people bring up, but I think is kind of key to it, is that you said it was it would have been around 2015? Oh, well, yeah, 20, it started 2014. 2014. It was 20, late 2014, 2014. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So late into Obama's second term, I think around that time, you had a lot of people very slowly starting to wise up how much it sucks to live in America. Like just this awful fucking neoliberal hellscape we all live in now. Yeah. Like no, you get so much less for how much more you pay and all this other shit. And then here comes this big, useful fucking smoke screen. 
to distract you from how much your material conditions suck. I don't think that's what it was created intentionally for, but that sure is how it ended up getting used. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, this, the, the, yeah, G- a Gamergate podcast is a whole other thing, but I definitely <laughs> yeah, think, yeah. I definitely think stuff like that, uh, for the Eltingville type of guys, there were a lot of bad parties in those forums saying like, Oh, are you mad that you don't like this game as much anymore? You just feel as unfulfilled. Well, the reason is feminists, or the reason is there's too many black people making games, or there's too many this or that, and that's why you're unhappy. Like, the answer to your unhappiness is diversity yeah. or or any of these things, which is just like, that's gross. I do hate that. Like, And it ultimately comes down to, like, I'm going to steal this from uh, Garbage Ape on Twitter, but it's like so many of those... Uh, reactionaries who are like oh well i have a whole new way of thinking guys oh what's your new way of thinking vote republican like that's gonna fix it it's like oh well well, fuck off yeah yeah it did just end up just being a huge fucking smoke screen and since then uh it used to be that culture war stuff was solely the domain of stupid right-wing dipshits but now it's it's also become the domain of rad libs and some left-leaning people, which is kind of disappointing to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just infected everything now. I mean, this is also uh, paraphrasing another podcaster, Matt Chrisman. It's like you can't actually win any political battles, so you have to start all these small-scale pop culture wars because nothing can actually be accomplished. Mm-hmm. There are things yeah, the- in place, so this this horrible status quo will last forever in America. But you can still yell online about a podcaster you hate or a show that offended you or a book in a library you don't like mm-hmm. like the m&m's mascot thing it's like you kind of look a little bar- more behind that it's like why is everyone talking about this now and it's like oh because they had that uh those hershey's and nestle's getting sued for slave labor right exactly <laughs> yeah so hey, I... child slave labor yes, ch- yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> even worse oh god yeah no it's uh yeah, Eltingville, honestly, even when he stopped Eltingville, he was just at the beginning of like that wave was coming up and now we are just in the crash of that wave. And I don't know what comes next. I don't like the Eltingville guys won. They either their reaction or reaction to them defined so much of pop culture. In a lot of ways, they took over the places of power in it as well. Mm-hmm. Like and it's just like, where do you go from here? It's also like we live in the world where the Eltingville guys got everything they wanted. Every movie is for them. Like, and I and I mean this about me too. Every movie is the movie I wanted when I was 17. And there is a certain emptiness you feel at the end of the day of <laughs> yeah. like, this is what I oh, this is the dream world I dreamed of. Why, why don't I feel fulfilled? Like you need to find fulfillment elsewhere in your life. Even once you see the movie where every Spider-Man hangs out with each other and you dreamed <laughs> of your whole life. You go like, well, then what happens? I got that. What what happens now? I mean, I think a discussion of fan culture is important for a subject material like this. And Gascan was speaking of it earlier that in 2014, people are starting to realize like, oh, uh, we're getting screwed. The economy is not great. We're not getting paid what we should be getting paid. There's no health insurance. And I think it's because of that that so many people, possibly us, can live extended adolescences because it's like, well, I could never start a family. I knew that 20 years ago. I would never have enough money. But I can surround myself with the things I enjoyed as a kid and podcast about them. And I think now now a lot of people can live in that uh, that kind of bubble uh, in negative ways. We, we were a very positive influence on the world, of yeah, course. So but we're great. But, but now so many more people, because they can't actually afford to move past this stage, they're just trapped there forever, and all they can do is argue online. Yeah, and I, I also think, too, like a, a sad thing is that everybody, I've, I'm just parroting somebody on Twitter, but it is that, like, you know, in the case of, there's so many of these examples, but in the case of, like, police brutality and wanting to, like, you know, defund the police reform the police spend the money differently all this talk about like the uh, police in america is fucked up and it needs to be fixed and there's no good cops all that stuff you can't change that like biden will just go like no you need to give him more money and all that then the response is like oh well you know this old episode of golden girls that has a blackface joke in it we'll just not have that <laughs> on online anymore it won't be available and it's like nobody asking for police reform or to like in the black lives matter community they didn't want though the, an episode of taken off of it. I mean, it's not wh- whatever on it being there or not, but it's like that wasn't the answer. That doesn't fix the <laughs> that particular problem with our uh, violent police state that kills 
disproportionately minority people in this country mm -hmm. yeah certain professional managerial class types were happy about that but regular people were not <laughs> one last thing i want to say about fan culture between uh then and now because like these four guys they were more of an anomaly in the 90s which in my mind is where they exist because in the 90s it's like well yeah the economy is great uh get married buy a house be an adult and the idea behind these four guys is just like, what? Why? What's your problem? Why are you so fixated in all this shit? <laughs> but now it's just like, well, I can't do anything and I can't afford everything. I guess I'll just watch Star Wars forever and talk about it forever. And that's how fan culture is so different from how it was even 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but all right. Uh, last thing I'll say is like, yeah, Evan Dorkin's still working on lots of stuff. You should definitely read his comics. He has a Patreon that's really cool as well. He's very responsive to fans online and on Twitter. I it was easy to source. The making of this because he is very open about it he even sells some of his original art if you love some of the original pages from uh eltingville or other dorkin comics uh he sells them online too support him uh and and sarah dyer's work and the last funny thing about how all this has come full circle i read an interview with him a few years ago where he mentioned that he and dyer had a daughter she is in her late teens now and is into cosplaying, comics, cool. other geek stuff. Right. And so now the circle of life, like now he is the parent of the nerdy character. But I, I would bet having a, a feminist wife probably taught him a lot of stuff in the 90s about how fucked up in, in a sexist way fan culture was. But now with a daughter, it's probably given him another like more firsthand experience into the world she is entering into as a fan of comics and other nerdy stuff. He's like, oh, this this thing is really fucked up. I can't write funny jokes about these guys anymore. <laughs> but OK, now after that heady discussion, let's take a break and travel back to the 90s when things were good and we were the ages of these characters. <laughs> and uh, we will come back and talk about the pilot. Welcome to Elting Bill. Welcome to the break, everybody. It's Henry Gilbert, who has nothing in common with any character on this podcast. Hey, everybody. It's BD, 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 Bob Mackey. Still learning about Buck Rogers. <laughs> I, I don't know enough about him. And a big thank you to Professor Gascan, our premium patron who picked out this podcast, and we had a real good time talking about it. And it's patrons like him and so many more that make this able to be me and Bob's full-time jobs. That's right. If you want to support the show and get all these episodes one week at a time and ad free, please head on over to patreon.com slash talking Simpson. Sign up there for five bucks a month. You get just that, but also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes over 100 bonus miniseries episodes and monthly access to regular episodes of both Talking Futurama and Talk King of the Hill, our two Patreon exclusive miniseries we're doing. If you like Talking Simpsons and what a cartoon, I'm sure you'll like those as well. And there's also a $10 level. When you sign up for that, you get all the $5 stuff, but also access to one super, super long podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Bob is talking about the what? A cartoon movie podcast where we cover an animated feature film just as in depth as we do Adult Swim failed pilots. Last week, you probably heard us talking about who framed Roger Rabbit in a fun, just small sample of what we did on that podcast. And you can hear the full thing if you are are a ten dollar and up subscriber and you get access to the back catalog that includes recent ones like pinocchio south park bigger longer and uncut coming this month you'll get to hear us talk about toy story 3 and there is a giant back catalog of over three years and 230 hours of podcast in addition to all the five dollar things bob mentioned as i love to say we cover everything from a kira to a goofy movie and all the rest please check it out at patreon.com slash talking simpsons and if you've never signed up for Patreon before, it's so easy to do. When you sign up, you're given a code. You can access that code whenever you want. You just drop that code into whatever you use to listen to podcasts. And that way you could easily listen to our bonus podcast alongside your free podcast as part of your podcasting lifestyle. And there is also an app that Patreon has for any smart device you have. Uh, you can download that and listen to our bonus content that way as well. But no matter which way you do it, it's so easy to access everything waiting for you behind the paywall at patreon.com slash talking simpsons now before you send us a letter writing campaign listen to the rest of our episode on welcome to eltingville a 
Attention swimmers. Adult Swim special. Next Sunday at 11.45 on Adult Swim. Parents strongly caution, the following programs are intended for mature audiences over the age of 18. These programs may contain some material that many parents would not find suitable for children and may include intense violence, sexual situations, coarse language, and suggestive dialogue. We are back for uh, the pilot discussion of Welcome to Eltingville. Uh, some overall guidance thing, too, they said about this is that in the comics, Dorkin just uses, like, he just draws Spider-Man and he draws Batman and characters just have a real enterprise. But uh, he says you just couldn't do that in this. Even as a parody, Cartoon Network told him, no, you, you just can't. And so uh, he said, quote, there are a couple references to my own work in here that I just threw in as a goof. There's a mil background milk and cheese, for example, and there's also toys of Mike Allred's Mad Men, Frank Miller's Sin City, the SLG comics as well. So he did get permission from from some of his buddies in the independent comic world to put his stuff in there, but otherwise they just make up the bulk. Or there's like a Spider-Man in the background that's painted blue. But well, they they have to draw Boba Fett at some point, and I want to know all about that. I do have the answer to that, okay. but uh, well, we'll get to that one. But yeah, this you couldn't do this without it being Boba Fett. But uh, you know, I realize this is the first time I've ever seen this. I didn't see it in the really? past, and I, and I convinced myself I did because this goes back to the Josh style friend I had. He really liked it. I don't. I don't think he saw himself in any of the characters. He just <laughs> even like, the guy <laughs> named John. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was just like, oh, they reference all these things. I just remembered him saying that. But like around this time was when we had our final friendship breakup, and I think I just thought about him when I thought about this uh, show. Uh. And maybe over time, I convinced myself I had seen it because I had seen so many like gifts and references. But this is the first time. Wow! Wow, man. And <laughs> unlike these guys, our friendship breakup was over a woman. Oh wow! Yes. See that. That's... You convinced yourself that your life was an episode of the show. Yeah. Hey, it happens sometimes. Uh... They weren't all happy days. <laughs> <laughs> hey, life imitates art. Uh, the, uh, well, you know, the women thing also that is a key part of the final Eltingville comic where they're just like, oh, yeah, a woman would have ruined the group. Like, I doubt any mm -hmm. woman. Like, Bill, uh, there's the fact that, like, Bill hates women, truly hates women. Josh is terrified of women. Pete sees women as just receptacles. And Jerry is the only person who grew up to have a healthy idea of women. And I think it's a consistent thing uh, that's even in the comics that I think uh, Dorkin figured out over time that it's like the main personalities in it are Bill and Josh fighting over who is the top nerd of the group. Everybody shits on Josh for being the fat guy. Pete is the horror weirdo who is like, uh, would have been a serial killer if he didn't <laughs> find uh, comics. And Jerry's the nice guy. Like, he usually, he's not the one to throw the first punch. He usually is the guy going like, come on, guys, let's have fun. Like, he's trying, he wants things to chill out, and he can't do it. He's like, kind of a mediator, although he will make fun of uh, the other guys, too. Yeah, hey, you know, you join in with it. It's how it goes. <laughs> but, but, yeah, so you have to understand that in 1999, when this was written, it was a novelty to see people playing D&D &D on television. It, it, it was a new thing. It wasn't that, very tired and old. I mean, we're going to be saying, can you imagine, but a lot in this podcast, but that was the uh, uh, like a, a fever dream that this thing called Critical Role could be one of the most popular things on the internet and that people can like buy merch of uh, just people playing D&D &D and their characters and then things like Harmon Quest. Nobody knew what any of this shit was. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> you had to be super inside. I think around the same time this was uh, greenlit was the freaks and geeks episode where they played D and D. And again, it's like stranger things. They just play D and D all the time. Actually this episode beginning with 
animating a campaign and showing the fantasy action that's literally the critical role spinoff show that just debuted on amazon like oh, the big budget animated series i forgot there's an animated series based on a tabletop campaign that people watched on twitch yep yeah that's that's, that's how on they, amazon now it is yeah I, uh look i don't know the name of it i bet i you know <laughs> in I'll, between episodes of invincible and like random roblox videos people put on that service the name of the series is The Legend of Vox Machina. That uh, It just debuted on, on Amazon. A big, big budget animated series. And I've, 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 I've heard good things from the fans of it. Uh, it sounds fine. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, a, a bit I didn't mention about Dorkin, though, that I think another reason he liked Eltingville is that sometimes if he just really fucking hated something, he could have the character say, <laughs> that thing was dog shit. And he could just be like, no, the character said that. I didn't I didn't say that. Oh, man, after my own heart. But uh, but yes, the, the episode begins with uh, them coming across a, uh, a big monster, a skeletal ripoff, as Pete calls him. And it's great. The first lines are Bill and Josh arguing over something. <laughs> it also took me out of it that these guys are named Bill and Josh. Uh, and That's we talk true. about Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein a lot on these podcasts. <laughs> it's true. I need to say Josh and Bill so we're not thinking of our <laughs> friends Bill and Josh here. <laughs> so in my tabletop role-playing campaigns, they did go something like this where you would have the one guy who kind of your horror friend who fucked and did drugs but still hung out with you as a, as a fellow nerd. He would think tabletop role-playing games were kind of fruity but would still do it and they would be like all right i'm playing but whatever you stupid way like the way pete just goes like yeah yeah whatever <laughs> that uh, i played with some guys like that what is D D up to now fifth edition i think it's still in the fifth i i don't think they put out a new edition since as as i said on our dungeons and dragons podcast uh for the animated series of what a cartoon I played tabletop role playing games, but never D and D. We were too cool for that. We played <laughs> we played the goth white wolf games of Vampire the Masquerade or uh, Magic the Awakening, not Gathering. Magic the Awakening. Yes, uh, twenty fourteen. Oh, <laughs> 2014 is when the fifth edition came out. Well, the most recent one. Yeah. The only thing I remember is like everybody complaining about fourth edition, but then saying, but it would really be really good in a video game. But then they never made a video game with fourth edition <laughs> rules. Uh, but uh, yes, they, you can also tell that the evil guy's voice is Jerry just pitched down here. And uh, we see Tiffany, uh, I think based on her name, I think it's supposed to be like a girl they like a cheerleader they like in high school. I think that's, that's exactly <laughs> what I assumed. <laughs> uh, but this also touches on a little bit. They actually deal with it more in the comic. A funny thing about tabletop role playing game when usually the group is all a bunch of men. The game master or dungeon master has to act out NPCs. So you have a bunch of uh, sexually frustrated virginal men, <laughs> and one of them has to act out the women that guys try to romance. And when you really deconstruct what was happening in those moments among us teenagers, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm a hot girl. Well, you going to talk me up or what? All right, roll the die. Ooh, <laughs> I'm so hot for you. Like, you said you were into alternative comics. Little did you know you were getting into an alternative lifestyle. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, look, if you if you stop to think about it for one second, you might think you were gay, and that would be uh, <laughs> terrifying. So you just got to plow through. It's role-playing. Yeah, you're role-playing. <laughs> anyway, so I have to agree with Josh, though. Bill is the one who tells the goblins to attack. They only listen when, listen when Josh tells them to. And so when Bill tries to blame him, he's like, no, Josh is right. He was motivating them. You're the one that sent them to their doom. I just motivated them. You might see that I agree with Josh a lot. Yes. In this. Uh, <laughs> he's not a good guy, Henry. No. Hey, look, I, I know. Hey, look, I never had a ponytail. And I'm not Jewish. In many ways, I'm different from Josh, actually. You know, where's your trench coat? Uh, <laughs> I never owned a trench coat either. That's because you grew up in Florida. It was really hot. You know, yeah. I knew trench coat kids in my Florida, though, and they were they were the bravest of them all wearing those heavy trench coats after they did it before and after Columbine, mm. too. You know what? I should have said that. Hmm. 
I think they were working on this right as Columbine started, and I bet that did also affect some of their their writing on this thing, as they were talking about violent uh, sociopathic nerds. In this hey, series. those Columbine guys were not like these guys at all. That they was were, yeah, media they, misrepresentation. Those Columbine guys were fake nerds, man. They were fake nerd guys. Guess what? They're in hell now. <laughs> I hope. I tried the trench coat and beanie look when I was in high school, and then someone said I looked like a bank robber, and I stopped doing it. Mm, yeah, that said, hurt. <laughs> when one person when somebody made fun of my rama one half shirt i was like well i'll never wear this to school again <laughs> nobody made fun of my shinji shirt though that's uh she said this is this was mail order you can't just walk into walmart and get this <laughs> <laughs> i had to get this from the viz catalog guys my mom had to send a check <laughs> Anyway, uh, there's also a joke about selkies, which are the fey deep sea creatures of the D&D world that transform between seal and human. And also part of tabletop role playing is saying that uh, it's not only playing the game, but also telling your friend that that's a bad storytelling. So you get to like live review a story while <laughs> it's like, oh, what an original idea. What did you think of that one? There's also a great joke of the antifreeze potion freezing. I like that. That gave me a chuckle. But yes, uh, we never came to fisticuffs, but I did get mad in some role playing games whenever I died of like, come on, man, just bring me, let me play the character again. <laughs> and the game master would be like, no, you have, your dead is dead. Make a new character. <laughs> and that hurts. But you spend so much time working on it and then it's like, oh, it's gone now. Now I got to do this all over again. And it took me like four hours. I know it takes like, you're barely even ready to start the game after four hours of making your character and rolling him and all that shit. Hearing about that, about tabletop games is why I never really got into them. <laughs> There's a great series of uh, Foxtrot comics where the little brother finally gets the big sister to, I know their names, by the way, I'm just not saying them on this. He finally gets her to agree to uh, play D&D. And every strip is basically just the character creation. And then he kills her instantly <laughs> after she creates a character. <laughs> oh, so it's like great. an entire day of her creating her character. And then he just kills her immediately. Jason and Paige. I know their names. They're in a lot of Fox no, I wasn't going to correct you. I knew you knew them. That, you know, that Bill Amend, he was, uh, his nerdiness came out more and more every year in that comic. Like he was... I loved Foxtrot as a kid, and when I, but it wasn't in my local comic thing. Same here. I could only read it in the collection. I had to buy the manga. Yeah. <laughs> also, sadly, we never played in a basement because we lived in swampy Florida. There's, you can't really build a basement in when you're below sea level. That's what makes this more of a northeast uh, kind of uh, flavor to it of Eltingville. Everybody's got a basement up there. Just full <laughs> crawling with nerds. Uh, you got to spray for them. Uh, but yes, uh, Bills also, I had some real, uh, in this first clip here is they fight over, uh, death in the dungeon master. I also had, uh, we never came to fisticuffs, but I'd say at least three times a parent did, uh, tell us to keep it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That wasn't fair. Josh's fat stupidity got me killed. I should be resurrected. <laughs> I can't do that, Bill. You're the dungeon master, Jerry. You can do anything. Now bring me back to life or I'll kill you. If you resurrect him, you gotta resurrect me. Me too. Oh, please. Oh, come hey, on. Hey, hey, you don't know what guys. 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 What the hell is going on down there? Uh, nothing, Mom. Nothing? You call medieval life and death nothing? I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> Tell your little freak friends to shut the hell up or get the hell out. Okay, Mom. I will. Good night. Nice going, Josh. Me? You started it. Oh, like hell I did. Like hell you did it! Big fat bantha butt! Greasy little gourd sport! <laughs> Yeah, again, I nothing in common with me and Josh. I don't know what you guys are talking about. You know, I I think I've mellowed out more. And also, you know what? What Josh's problem is, I see now, is that he doesn't exercise enough to let out his energy. And instead, he's just like this uh, steaming pile of rage at all times. And we, and also very sensitive about his weight. They, there's a running gag uh, that Dorkin does in later comics that shows that Josh... He wants to get prizes from like cereal or bread or macaroni and cheese. And his friends are just like, yeah, throw out the food. We just get the box <laughs> tops. And he's like, no, I have to eat the entire box of macaroni and cheese. Like I have to eat all the sandwich bread. That's the tragedy of Josh there. But yes, my mom and dad, they got angry at our loudness over usually perfect dark or smash brothers or mario kart games mm. we, we get really into those and yell about it and i recall one time a fa my father coming in like don't you ever go to bed <laughs> 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 
for me it was mario party and getting extremely pissed off at it yes yeah that that game is made to make you have arguments with your friends it absolutely is it's meant to have people fight i think the basement in high school i hung out in the parents were mostly drunk uh, so they were either passed out or too drunk to care so you know find those broken homes to hang out in the basements of <laughs> uh unfortunately my house was the hangout house though because we had the most game consoles uh so that's that's uh they other kids their parents didn't get tortured half as much as my parents i feel <laughs> i feel bad for my mom mainly that she had to hey, listen to these loud loud idiots most of the time uh especially as jackass became more popular in our in our group <laughs> but <laughs> First she bought you all those toys and then she had to put up with that. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I I I treat my mom very well now. I regret every podcast I do is me saying I'm sorry, mom, out loud. <laughs> like I feel that <laughs> but all right, so then after their fight, we comes to the opening, which is a fun little parody of Batman sixty six, even in, in music style. My favorite bit is to shove another shove uh, coming on screen as they throw kids out of the way of their toys. I never battled with children over toys at a toy store. I was not really, look, I'm not saying I don't own toys, but <laughs> I was not a go to Toys R Us first thing and, and fight over waves of character guys. Yeah, That's not I was, how I was. I was not as aggro as any of these characters, thankfully. I yes. was not a pusher or a shover or a hitter. I, I never did that. I did get on the receiving end of that as like an eight-year-old once, though. <laughs> Somebody stole. Uh, a toy from you um what it was is i was um it was an arcade and some guy was playing some uh vertical shoot em up i think it was 1942 or something and as i was just about like oh hey this is two player he's like don't touch it <laughs> <laughs> yeah my dad was ready to kick that guy's ass actually <laughs> Uh, and they also they had to make up uh, major violence and Ma mushroom man and all these other guys because they can't they can't just like you know Star Trek or whatever. But uh, you know one thing their their interests really smack of the '90s in that I feel like today if this was a modern uh, a modern version of this it would be like the anime and manga guy and like the gamer. Yes, you know <laughs> even though they do play video games in this, but I think in their terms gaming is like D and D and like video games are for like kids or whatever. Dorkin would have been a gamer if he'd have gotten into it in the when we did like he would have been like he uh you had like one pong game you couldn't get obsessive about it like we were able to in our youths you know when this came out i was 19 almost 20 and so like yeah i had just aged out of being these guys and was still this these guys mm -hmm. when this aired telling myself i wasn't these guys that's why i want to tell myself they're like 21 or 22 <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh but yeah they're all jerks here stealing stuff and you get to see pete with his broken vhs like this also is the last time you do vhs jokes in a cartoon as well i think i think in 2002 i was still recording things on vhs mm, yeah i think i was recording the the last Simpsons episodes in 02, I was still recording. And by last, I mean the last ones I was recording actively because once I started dropping out of college, I also like fell off of Simpsons stuff. But, but that's a story for our Simpsons podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, uh, I also think it's funny that as they all are beating each other up the entire time, we also get to see Jane Dickey there, who again, she's, uh, I think is a little inspired by Dyer's childhood. I think it, it, it gave, gave her more of a representation in the series too. That's another thing that's changed. And we talked about it briefly, but uh, yeah, no, uh, no women. And that's not because, you know, Dorkin is a sexist. It's just like, this is accurate to the time period. And growing up, it's just like, well, of course, women aren't into anything I'm into. And it's so weird when they are, but now it's things are so much different and it's so much better now sure uh, they're not as excluded they're still excluded in many ways <laughs> but it's still not as strange to encounter a woman who's into a lot of nerdy things as it was in the 90s and in the 90s women were into nerdy things but they why would they want to be around guys like the eltingville guys who question them at every second and are mainly just projecting onto them the like you're about to reject me woman so i'm rejecting you first like there's there's a good bit as time goes on in the second to last Eltingville comic, which is all about how shit comic book stores are or how shitty bad ones are. There's lots of good comic books. Well, there's some good comic <laughs> book stories. A lot of them are closing now, but the, they have a joke in it where one, the the guy who runs the shop is like kids come in and ask for manga. And he's like, I, I we have comics here. We don't do that shit. Uh, just him turning away a uh, business. And then when a girl comes in and she's like, hey, do you have the new <laughs> collection of Saga? Like, she's like, I will buy a comic right now. Every guy there looks at her, 
takes a photo of her and then she runs out <laughs> and they're like see a fucking fake geek girl she didn't even know her shit enough to stay here and let us even ask her about what she likes about that comic that that really reminds me i was at a comic book store recently uh it was in vancouver and uh, i mean people that were nice but you know what's popular today is not what was popular in the 90s i'm just looking around and like the only manga they have is like tucked in the back of the store on this turnstile and it is all it was all placed in the store in like 1998 because it's all like super yellowed flipped uh old viz manga that's sad. and they never ordered anymore you know what? it never moved maybe they were correct to never get anymore but it just shows like there are certain guys who think well this is the only kind of comic book there is yep yeah and that uh i think too in the comic uh he even makes a joke of like Amazon fucking sucks, but this is why these people go to Amazon because they wanted to buy it from you and you were an asshole to them. So they just, they're like, fine, then I'll just go to Amazon and buy this shit. I don't care. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so last bit in the, on the opening here is that I think it is very Evan Dorkin that he put his created by credit next to a garbage can. Like that is very, <laughs> his, his, his style. But yeah, so from this point to uh, the end of their their fight scene in the act, this is an adaptation of the first Eltingville comic as the meeting begins. Start with you, Jer. Beedy, beedy, beedy. Okay, Buck. Well, I collected all 300 letters we wrote under assumed names to Paramount to make a Captain Sulu show. All we need now is the 99 bucks postage and we'll show them Trek fans mean business. Good work, Jer. Pete? Yeah, well, I finally got my thing with Two Heads Bootleg Resin Kit, and I built it up last night during Sliders. And, like, I did a real good job on Rosie Greer's head. But Ray Milan's head kind of looks like a potato or a yam or something. So I'm thinking of putting it on eBay to see if I get back some of the 70 bucks I paid for it. Okay. Josh and Stein? Well, I just got this video in the mail today. A hot little fan-made number called Sexy Sirens of Sci-Fi and Horror Revealed. <laughs> Volume 10, two hours of film clips featuring Scream Queens, B-movie starlets, and even some real actresses in movies <laughs> where they're topless or worse. Beedy, beedy, beedy. Hubba, hubba, buck. <laughs> Those Buck Rogers references, I did have to look that up because yes, I was like, yeah. Peter Griffin did this once. What is this? <laughs> yeah, let's. With the, I never knew this Buck Rogers shit. Only thanks to this, like I never, never paid attention. Tweaky looks okay, and I mean, obviously, when if you look at some Buck Rogers stuff, you're like, oh, that's what Star Wars was, among other things, ripping yeah. off. Like, especially Tweaky is. Uh, there's more than a little of him in C3PO. I actually did know the Buck Rogers thing from, of all things, a Genesis RPG that they made based on Buck Rogers. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. I that, didn't know Countdown that. to Doomsday. That's right. I had no idea what it was, and I still kind of don't. It made me laugh, though. The uh, Jerry talks about uh, writing letters to Paramount to make the Sulu show, and it makes me think, like you said, Henry, everyone gets their way now, where this was 35 years after Star Trek, the original series. We are now 35 years after TNG, and Picard Season 2 is about to yep. come out. Yep, yep, yep. So it's like, yeah, they, they everyone, these guys won. They won. <laughs> yeah. These guys got what they wanted. They you don't got... <laughs> have to write letters to Paramount. They're like, we can never make new IP. Is Patrick Stewart still alive? Yes. Will he do this? Yes. And well, also, it's one of those things. Uh, the way it works out is like the Sulu show, the history on that was a real thing. Like, oh, okay. Uh, George Takei, in the final Star Trek film, Six, he had become a captain of, of his own ship, the Excelsior. And they actually filmed a pilot for it as a backdoor pilot, though, that ran as a Voyager episode. But then Paramount passed on it late in the 90s. And George Takei among me, uh, was like spurring on the fans to be like, guys, I want to do this. If you want a Sulu show, do it. But back then, UPN was like, well, that's not going to get 8 million viewers. But now, something that would only get 100,000 people to watch it, if that gets that 100,000 people to sign up for Paramount Plus, they're going to do it. Absolutely. Like, it's it's so different. Like, the nicheness, I guess, yeah, it's not just that those guys get the, their way more often. It's that everything is just so niche and splintered now that if you appeal to that low an amount, that's enough to get your own Paramount Plus series. Yeah, like, we have 2,500 patrons. That's all we need. That's it is no, all actually, we need, we need more. Oh, yes, Tell all of your yeah, friends. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, Pete's talking yep. about the thing with two heads. I have seen this movie, and I'll tell you what, guys. It's kind of boring. <laughs> it's not as exciting as the premise makes it seem. And I swear to God, like 35 minutes of it are just one car chase. It, t oh. it goes on for. Ever. And so that's why they're on a motorcycle in his toy uh, or his model kit. Then, yes. I guess. That's 
I only knew it from Treehouse of Horror as a reference, yeah. But I did watch some sliders back in my day. I did too. Only the first uh, season. I never followed it to uh, sci-fi. I was only on the Fox run. Mm. I think too, Dorkin, this bit with the letter writing campaign came from his belief then that like, oh, if you get, you know, uh, especially his friend who got all those letters for killing off ice in Justice League, uh, he's like, this looks like a lot of letters, but it's probably one guy sending them from, from uh, 300 <laughs> letters like that. That was his belief then. But now the new version of that is like, oh, all of these uh, brand new accounts on Twitter are yelling a bit me about uh, some uh, Ethan Van Skyver shitty new comic like comic gate as well happened. Mm-hmm. That's another of like those awful shitty things that uh, the funny thing about Skyver is that I I actually thought I didn't know him, but then I looked it up and I'm like, oh yeah, you drew like the grossest, ugliest looking X-Men comics. Now I remember you. He sure did. He sure did. Yeah. He's, uh, I think it's pretty funny that uh, he stopped working for DC when Jeff Johns stopped being a president there. And uh, everybody wants to act like Jeff Johns was a nice guy, but uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm saying I, be- I believe Ray uh, as well on that. The, uh, the, the, the cyborg actor saying that uh, Jeff John sucks shit as well as Joss Whedon. That's something too. This was written when Joss Whedon was the king of the nerds and mm-hmm. everybody loved him online. Ooh. And yeah. Yep. Firefly was uh, just freshly canceled, I think. Oh, I, I know too. Yeah. yeah. Was. Yep. 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 What an outrage. Yeah, we better <laughs> start that letter writing campaign. <laughs> I'm going to give myself some credit. I never liked him or Buffy. <laughs> hey, me too. I'm there with you, guys. I can't. Can. Oh, look, yeah. I can't lie. I gave it. I like. I really did like Firefly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I take it back. I can't, <laughs> it can't. I can't go back to it now. Obviously, you're but, forgiven. Uh, we're all forget. We're all given amnesty. If you ever like Joss Whedon, you're, you're now given amnesty. <laughs> but you have to. But just like amnesty, you have to apply for it. You can't just. <laughs> yes. It's not blanket to everybody. And you, have to you can say. apply to it for signing up to our Patreon. That's, true. That's how it works. <laughs> So this new scenes VHS collection, though, that I mean, you you could buy those at cons. You'd see them around like, uh, yeah, you'd, you'd have to wink at a certain guy. I, I like this, too, because I was buying uh, bootleg tapes up through probably 2002, uh, uh, mostly based on like Internet people uh, to get Mystery Science Theater episodes yes. and anime fan subs. And it was a crapshoot. Like sometimes some of those MST3K recordings were really bad and it, it would be like a meta game of like riding the track on it to make sure like oh is this perfect okay it's sort of like you're playing WarioWare while watching mystery science theater almost mm, yeah. uh, <laughs> but though though this bit about nude scenes this is why mr skin started for guys like this and if you don't know mr skin i i hey, good for you you're not a perv but oh hey yeah. we're all curious yeah, hey uh, but yes mi- mr skin existed because a friend would tell you, do you like actress Y? Well, she was naked in movie X and it would tell you like then rent this movie and you can see them uh, naked. And over time, Mr. Skin just graduated into being a website of like, we just have only the nude scenes sign up for this and you can look at that. And like, for example, the Tasha Yar they're mentioning is actress Denise Crosby. And it's probably her nude scene from 48 hours. As my research told me, <laughs> I did not know. My research told me she posed in Playboy. 1988 ah well all right <laughs> but that's not a movie that's true although but... those pictures are available i will say i do like the stank that josh puts on he says even some real actresses that's great <laughs> yeah that he sees them that one he is happy to masturbate to them but he will still look down at them as not real actresses <laughs> and what also puts us back in 99 is the mention of a xena character that's which I was right. like, what, who is Callisto? And I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that because I my first thought on Callisto is the X Men character, and of course I mean of the Marauders, not actually an X Men member, though maybe Callisto has become an X Men member by this point. I'm correcting the Eltonville people. I'm imagining <laughs> in my brain they occupy my brain, and I think of them correcting me if I'm slightly wrong on something. I mean, if you if you just Google Callisto Zeno, uh, Callisto Zena rather, uh, she's just like a very attractive blonde woman. So mm-hmm. these guys would want to see her naked, and you you kind of had to be there. Like no one ever talks about Zena. I don't know if it's streaming anywhere, but it was so huge. That's why Lucy Laws was on The Simpsons yeah. in uh, 2000. I think it was. Yeah, it's uh, and now it's the only one you can go back and watch because Kevin Sorbo is such a piece of shit now that <laughs> you can't watch Hercules, the show that started it. Xena, I think, is is still pretty good or uh, holds up much better. 
though now they could just be lesbians and they could just be gay on it instead of having to just wink at it all the time <laughs> yeah kevin sorbo he became jerkules yeah. <laughs> This this whole bit about actresses in nude scenes thing, it does make me think about how the last 20 years, actresses of our generation and younger, the ones older than them, when they did nude scenes in movies, they knew what they were getting in for of like, yes, I'm going to be naked in a movie, probably in a scene to titillate people, or they're going to be naked in a scene for like plot purposes. They need to be nude for it. Then those actresses found out by the the start of the internet that those scenes would be removed from any context and only be used as jerk off material by awful people. But yeah. since the internet, I wonder what most actresses now know that like if they're gonna do a nude scene in something, I think they really have to be committed to it because they or they you know, you don't have to care that people are masturbating to you. It doesn't make you dirty, but I also it's think part of the math. I also think most younger notable actresses have had their phones hacked. And all of their well, nudes are online anyway. Yes. So it's like, why do I have to get naked for a movie? My pi my privacy has been violated already. That's true. Yeah. Ugh. And just recently, you'd mentioned the, what was it? The Cersei Lannister actress. Her oh, saying, you know, I would have yeah. done, yeah, I would have done the nude scene for the walk of shame if it happened earlier. But now that it's like season five or whatever, no, get a digital double it's, for me, please. Yes. Yeah. That's what, you know, what I think is the cheapest thing is on that Euphoria show, those young actors who, who are of age, they they play teens, but they're not teens. Some of the girls, they show their boobs in it, but the guys, when they show their dicks, it's fake dicks. Like uh, those, if the girls have to show their boobs, the guys should have to show their dicks. Why, you know? why, also, why are we convinced ourselves that show's important? Is it because Zendaya <laughs> writes an essay that she posts on Twitter before every episode? I guess. I think yeah. that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's sleaze. It's just sleaze. <laughs> that show uh, is weird. I, I don't get it. And again, it's And not, you're allowed to enjoy sleaze. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> but it's also like not, it's written by a guy our age who is Barry Levinson's son. Let's so. make these girls kiss. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> Speaking of weird, a bunch of guys are excited to watch porno together, which I don't think I ever did this with my pals. I think the worst we watched uh the movie High Tension, the uh mm. the the French horror film together, and we didn't know this was in our my my parents' living room. We didn't know there was an extended scene of a girl masturbating in it and we were all very uncomfortable. I'll just speak for myself. I was very uncomfortable watching this with my pals, but uh, that's we didn't watch nude scenes together. Yeah, I think getting horny I, together would have been a fridge too far for my friends and I at that I time. I don't understand that. Like, what am I gonna like masturbate in front of my friends? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't. But uh, yes, because then it's like that's too gay for guy. Like a circle jerk is. You may as well just be gay at that point. <laughs> I would think. Like, <laughs> Like, let's cut out the middlemen. Why are we looking at these women and touching our dicks next to each other? Let's just touch each other's dicks and just get <laughs> get, get, get going. It's here. what we call the advanced stranger technique. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yes, uh, they put it on and uh, it's not what they had hoped for, which also didn't. Did you guys get, you know, transplanted back to the days of tracking when that tracking blue screen came on there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And I, this made me happy. I was never uh, swindled when it came to buying a bootleg. Yeah, yeah me neither. The, the only self-addressed stamp envelope I sent away for a bootleg DVD like that or VHS like that in the mail was the end of Evangelion, and the guy came through for me. He did. He did the job. Speaking of yeah, speaking of the tape trading scene, I liked how some people tried to make it legit, where it's like you send me the tapes, and then I'm sending you a tape with something back on it. But after a while, people are just like, just pay for the tapes. It's fine. Yeah, just uh, why? This is all illegal, anyways. Every that was too people being too cautious. I yeah. Guess. But you know. Uh, but yes, as he's about to play the tape. Josh says, laugh it up, goofballs, which is a Star Wars reference that I definitely got as a child, uh, even. But though, of course, the line by Han Solo is laugh it up, fuzzball, which is when the uh, Chewbacca laughs at him after Princess Leia makes fun of him in the opening to Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I do like Pete's line. He's blocking the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, the tape isn't what they thought. Tushy, you're naked. That's the Hair Bear Bunch. <laughs> That's it. I'm gonna rip your bitty bitty heads off. Help! I'm blind. Jerry, you fool. That stuff's worth more than your mother.
deal with you two later. But you, I never want to speak to again. That goes double for me. Everything goes double for you, Jabber Jaws. <laughs> ah, who needs them? We're still on for the movies tomorrow, right? <laughs> you know what this means, don't you? This means the end of the Eltingville Club. Hey. Ingerios are still good. Uh, also, every Eltingville Club comic ends with, is this the end of the Eltingville Club? Yes. Yeah, like all the fun, like it just reminded me of how, uh, I don't know if young men are like this today. I hope things are better, but just the hostility you had to show to anybody who was your friend. Yep, yeah. If you were if you were too nice, you might be called gay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It, just from what I see, just like when kids show up at the store and retail, they don't generally act that way anymore. <laughs> I would hope kids feel at least a little more, you know, friendly to people. I think I think of our pals uh, who, you know, worked on Steven Universe, that that show was by people who grew up in our shitty childhoods going like, maybe kids today could be a little nicer. Maybe we can show them a, a way to be nice and not like an asshole to every friend of yours. There is an Eltingville type guy on that show, too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Ronaldo is his name. And and it's a perfect parody. All the Dorkin, I will say, Dorkin had a, a statement about how like some people have accused other people of ripping off Eltingville. When he's like, "No, this is ripe territory. Everybody knew these type of guys, or are these type of guys." Yes. And so he said, like, he likes Casey Green's work, our, our pal Casey Green, and he's like, "I do not think that his anime club ripped me off. Like, it's a different, it's a different genre." No, anime club is great by Casey Green. It is uh, if if uh, Eltingville are their millennial are their Xers. Uh, anime club are, is a story of millennials. Yeah, and it, I yeah. think it's very accurate to being a millennial in in a group like that. But uh, here's the big differences from the comic. In the comic, the tape is a Lidsville episode, but I think it's funnier they make it the Hair Bear Bunch because they can actually show it because it's Hanna Barbera. So it wasn't the completely forgotten Sid <laughs> and Marty Croft show, uh, Lidsville. <laughs> and also, the comic ends, instead of them yelling at each other in an alley, it ends with all four of them in their bedrooms failing to jerk off because they're so mad at each other and that's <laughs> that's why they come back to get too hot for tv <laughs> yes yeah well i mean when you put it that way of like well yeah we're gonna draw 17 year old men trying to jerk off it's like eh, maybe we don't draw that's that. more of a big mouth <laughs> idea <Yeah. Ugh>. yeah. <laughs> God. but make I them do... 10 yeah. <laughs> yeah i do like the uh disgusting sight gag of jerry being blinded by uh josh's zip juice <laughs> Ugh. Uh, the, that's something too for the level of detail in the comics all of them are pockmarked with in, in terrible acne on every cell of their face like which uh you know <laughs> happens yeah, to, uh, happens yeah, to yeah, the weird. best of us guys in high school you know yeah i mean when i was yeah. in high school i thought you know well at least this is temporary and i'm almost 40 and it's just well it's not <laughs> you still get pimples uh, it sucks yeah brv i'm just gonna upload that clip to those that popping stuff right uh, no don't oh yeah right. this is before the era of dr pimple popper people right. tune in for this <laughs> this i will say this is it stuff and the pus stuff does disgust me like i can't i was worried about it. this anyway. i hate it i really do it <laughs> the, there's the one section of this episode i didn't get a clip from is the dream sequence that comes after the first commercial break which is not a commercial break as it aired in adult swim but it's the was. only part of this i didn't like i just thought it was uh even by 2002 or 99 uh this kind of star wars or sorry star trek parody was a little uh dated this you know? guy doesn't know star trek from star wars <laughs> <laughs> one of them's about wars yeah no i'm yeah. I, there's I only was, one war in the movie i saw i was just becoming josh there i'm <laughs> sorry uh, the dream sequence does inform what kind of a geek he is though because you do have like the dating what is it the the ship is designed like the set from the dating game yes yeah, yeah. And, I, like the underlying current of uh sexual frustration is appreciated it, yeah. it just shows what uh motivates all of these guys and what they need to get out of their systems and that he wants to fuck buffy xena and the one and wonder woman along with other women in there too yeah i i mean as as well you know what i thought is funny what did Chuck Sheets direct right after this? I'm going to Praise Land. What does that have? Comic book guys, sexual fantasy on the oh, Enterprise deck. Yeah. You know what? I was thinking of that while watching this. I forgot it had the same director. And he's got like a space burrito or something. A space burrito. Though, yeah. though, though in his vision, he's Spock. But he is fucking specific dorky women uh, that he had a crush on in the 60s, which was uh, Uhura 
Agent 99 and, uh, oh, man, it's one of the Batgirls, I think, too. Yes, like Lee Merriweather or it's something. Lee Merriweather, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not Batgirl, it's Catwoman. It's Catwoman. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> uh, sorry. It's, uh, it was but, Catwoman and Agent 99. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think that shows you where uh, where Al Jean, Al Jean and my, Evan Dorkin had different uh, fantasies growing up, I think. That shows one's about five years older than the other. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, so the Zit planet is disgusting to me. I don't want to talk about it too much more, honestly. Them being buried in his like pus from his zits, like blech. But the drawing of the crater face is that's just an Evan Dorkin drawing. And when you see that on screen, it's like, well, they couldn't animate that. It can be a background element, but there's no way they could animate that entire thing. Though I will say the Tama Productions, they're doing their anime best with the torrent of pus burying everybody under it. Like it actually is too well done. Like that looks too expensive and well done. Yeah, just stopping and thinking, hmm, what does that smell like? I wonder. Yeah. All right. Hey, so then he wakes up from his dream. <laughs> Uh, uh, and that's when he has this bad dream that it's used as this bridging device between the two ones because uh, the comic they're just friends in the next comic as uh, as they all head to the movies which I don't see anything in common with with how I am today where I feel like I have to watch every movie in the <laughs> Marvel Universe what's the deal I thought you weren't talking to Jazzilla no more yeah well I had this like freaky premonition kind of thing last night that Kind of made me realize that for the sake of the club and our friendship and all, I should patch things up with the big fat stupid load. Plus, I was afraid I wouldn't get back the Doctor Who DVD I lent him last week. Okay, so the plan is we watch the Jaws ripoff first, then sneak into the Alien ripoff, and then sneak into the Halloween ripoff. Eldingville Club, go! <laughs> One ticket, one movie. <laughs> Man, that was just butt. Yeah, and just when the female mating ritual scene was starting. Well, they can throw us out of the movies, but they can't break us. Because we're better than them. The jocks, the norms, the unimaginative pods. That's why we have to stick together. So let's get out there and make the most of the day in the mighty Eltingville Manor. <laughs> Uh, the Mighty Eltingville Manor is a reference to the Mighty Marvel Manor that uh, Stan Lee would explain. Uh, this is a great new pulse-pounding story told in the Mighty Marvel Manor. So that's that, that That's that reference. But I was wondering why he didn't rhyme it like the great Eltingville way. <laughs> but, uh, but also now all the ripoffs they'd watch they would just be remakes they wouldn't be a ripoff with a new title that's that's how much worse geeky genre cinema mm. is now that they're like why even rip it off just put the title on it would yeah. aliens 3 have come out by now mm, oh yeah uh, yeah that was 92 uh yeah and that, resurrection was like 97 yeah so resurrection's already out at that point yeah oh god what a bad fucking movie speaking <laughs> of just sweden yeah yeah if you told me which one would I rather watch, I'd rather watch Resurrection than three, though, I think. I think uh, three, I just hate them killing off Newt is one of the most depressing things I saw right. in the movie. Like, how awful they did that. That was hilarious in that awful uh, Colonial Marines game, how they explain how... Uh, oh. what, was, what was Michael Bean's characters again? Hudson? Or, Hudson, no, yeah. Hudson. I think it's Hudson. Yeah, it's Hudson. Like, apparently he just, oh, somebody else, did, he got broken out of his cryopod, and then someone who looks exactly like him got placed inside instead. That's how it, <laughs> that's, that's how it worked. How helpful. That's great. Oh, God. All the stuff they do together reminds me of me and my college friends, because the difference between them and us is you needed a car to do anything, mm, yeah. which is why these guys can just walk around the city and do stuff. There's Nobody's driving, but it wasn't until college when I could drive that I could actually... What's my entire weekend? Pick up my friends. We go to Borders. We hang out there for a couple hours. We go to the toy store. We go to like three video game stores. And then we probably watch anime at my in my childhood bedroom at my uh, house. I like the accuracy of this too to my own childhood because yeah, it was or teen years, which was the mall was everything but the comic book store like you at the mall. You could eat the garbage at a McDonald's and get a happy meal. You could go to the Suncoast video and look at anime. You could go to the books a million and read all the comics. And then you could go see a movie at the AMC theater attached to it. That was the orange park mall. But uh, the funny thing when I watched this was 
I was working at a movie theater by that point. So I was actually on the other side of these guys' experiences. Like I was the kind of person who was meant to enforce uh, preventing people from ju- uh, skipping into theaters, which mainly I didn't care about. I, sometimes if a manager was watching me closely, I'd be like, hey, you can't come back in. Sorry. And now they're so understaffed that nobody cares about theater hopping. I, I, I wouldn't do it because I have more to do in a day than just see a bunch of movies, but it feels like nobody's here. I don't have a stub. Like, I could just live here. <laughs> my, I swear my local theater uh, near me, there must be one person who uh, runs concession and tears tickets. They do both things. One person who cleans the theaters and one person who runs the projectors. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone else working there. And nobody wants to hire any more people no. to do any of these jobs. That's because nobody wants to work, but That's right. Nobody wants to... I could barely stand to stay in for one movie at a theater because <laughs> then my clothes start smelling like old steel popcorn butter and cleaning fluid uh having worked at a movie theater that scent uh disgusts me to my <laughs> core i can't every every movie is two and a half hours long so when it's over i'm like i want to live get me out of here <laughs> sorry henry didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you yeah no, yeah no. the card says two hours later so they wouldn't have even gotten through a modern movie now that's true yeah this is more like they watched one 90 minute movie and then watched another and then went into another one well also like when I went to that Spider-Man movie, I knew I had to block out like, well, yeah, four hours from now, we're going to have to get the lift home because <laughs> this is a three hour movie. And then there's all the trailers, which are 30 fucking minutes of trailers at the Why film are these so fucking long? <laughs> <laughs> also, in another of uh, uh, admitting how similar I am to these guys. I wore Bill's Madman shirt. I had the shirt he wears in this scene, though I more often wore the black and yellow variant of it. Where and I would, I would have a very Josh reaction when people would be like, "That's Shazam, huh?" I was like, "One, you're talking about Captain Marvel, not Shazam." Two, no, this is a reference to Mike Alred's Madman <laughs> comic. Excuse me. I'm gonna punish you for taking an interest in me. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a lot of friends and went on so many dates back then oh man <laughs> one quick background gag i really did like was the rasho monster poster that's a good yeah i like that. yeah who can say how tokyo was destroyed <laughs> <laughs> uh and yeah so they then flashed all the stuff they do during the day which uh yeah you you also told yourself a lot these dumb speeches about how like actually i'm better than my bullies which i guess now you know what Thanks to Facebook, you can look up your old bullies and see if you're doing better than mm-hmm. them. And I think I am doing better than them. I have. I used to think this was a trite thing to say, but most of them are either like again, like deadbeat dads or dead. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> deadbeat dads beat dead. <laughs> I looked up one person who was particularly unpleasant to deal with in high school. I was like, oh, I wonder how she's doing. And then I found out she had like been in several unsuccessful marriages with very. Uh, very awful uh, ex-convicts and i just said Ooh. you know i can't even gloat about this this is just depressing yeah that's very <laughs> sad like yeah <laughs> uh so the uh, the kids go to their toys r us parody which yes that is what happened mostly at toys r us is that you would uh pay off some guy to get you the good toys that the the rarer ones so you could sell them on ebay usually no more toys r us for us in america yeah although there are still <laughs> toys r us is in uh canada <laughs> thanks to good old bain capital venture capital is always the greatest and yeah, that's uh, <laughs> uh and then they also fight over mcdonald's toys which i guess they're still happy meal toys right those still exist oh absolutely yeah Uh, that's still when they were worth playing with yeah but now the the toys teach you how to code Mm -hmm. and you're given a bag of apples with it oh man and could you imagine just playing a video game at a kiosk at a store like yeah those don't exist no more (laughs) in particular what i do miss are those uh video kiosks which i mean you couldn't play with them but they had like the big sheet with the plastic buttons you would press down that would show you different trailers for yeah that that's something too that made me feel so old in this then in some of the comics they talk about like we gotta watch this trailer i was like every trailer is available to you at all times every second on youtube like seeing a trailer is not special now either yeah it, it's why e3 sucks now and why i have no interest in it because it's like well you're just going to show these trailers and i can look them up anyway well now e 3s just dead or it, well it's a digital event but it's dead <laughs> there's no more <laughs> So, yeah, they uh, we, just like in our recent King of the Hill, they have a joke about uh, virgins ogling a Victoria's Secret as well at the mall. And then they decide there's only one place to go, their local comic book shop. 
Well, here we are, men. I give you our local comic book shop. Oh, please, oh, please, 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 what? Yes! Yes! I got it! Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, guys! Guys! Ah, great. Will it be to wanna be? Why can't somebody just like put that little geek out of our misery? Back Ow! <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Oh, I I'm okay, hey! <laughs> oh my God. Come on, come on! Hurry! Oh. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Man, what a rip. Thanks for nothing, Will. <laughs> I tell you, we can't catch a break. <laughs> Hello? Somebody? See, is that from the comic? That scene? Uh, no, the, okay. this character was created for the series. That's what I yeah. felt. Uh, I mean, this is a funny scene, but it feels like the wrong scene for the pilot where you immediately are like, I don't want to follow any of these guys on their adventures. <laughs> They're the worst fucking guys. Yeah, this scene is a funny joke, but it also reminds you, like, these are why these guys shouldn't star in a TV show. Yeah, like, this should be like an episode nine or something <laughs> when you're already on board. Uh, a fabulous animation of him getting hit by the motorcycle. <laughs> There's a great posing of Willoughby when he's coming out of the store. It's very uh, Stephen DiStefano. Exactly. Yeah, I thought like, oh, this is Ren and Stimpy as hell. His giant like wild take, like, oh yes, oh yes, like yeah. And and uh, MC Chris uh, does great acting on it too. Uh, and yeah, Evan Dorkin has a lot of it, uh, answers to like, yeah, shitty comic book stores are why the comic industry sucks so hard in America because. They are like a dingy rat's nest that is that the guy lives in. And basically, he just turned a store into his comic book collection. It is incredibly unfriendly to uh, people. And also, because it is such a, like, no-money business, it usually is in a horrible location <laughs> uh, and <laughs> falling apart. Like, he, there's a bit in one comic that Dorkin says he took just straight from real life of, oh, yeah, I have a leaky roof, and I just put a kiddie pool on top of the roof to, uh, to collect all the water in it when it rains. Like... Yeah, the I don't think those like it says population two hundred forty thousand. This is located way, way, way on the fuck the edge of town, and apparently right in front of a garbage dump. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I also like Willoughby the wannabe. It is a very specific type of kid who is like, he's the young kid who wants to prove to the older dorks like the Eltingville guys who actually looks up to them, which is extra sad. And so then the Eltingville guys who are used to being the low ones on the Tilden Pool, they then treat kids like that like absolute shit and steal their cards and kick them as they're dying <laughs> because they're like, again, they're total assholes. <laughs> Also on the uh, on the front of the store, there are some more references to Madman, Atomics, Sin City, SLG, and Stray Bullets, the David Lapham comic, which I don't know if I've told you this before, Bob, but I think if you were to read one comic that has a finite number of issues, like 50 issues, American comic, I think you would love Stray Bullets. It is It is a modern noir kind of thing. I definitely have heard of it. It's black and white. David Lapham's great. David Lapham also wrote one of my favorite Matrix one-off comics. Like hmm. he's he's awesome. I I love his work. Oh, and another one you'd love is his uh, twelve issue called Murder Me Dead. Like it's it's basically him doing his um the postman only knocks twice kind rings of rings uh, whatever <laughs> he can knock too if the if the doorbell yeah, what am I in a trivia competition here? What the <laughs> this is a trivia. <laughs> but yes, they all they all just shit on him. Then they head into the store and. This is definitely written by a person who knows how people talk in a comic book store. Dude, Pokemon stinks. It's way over. You mock the power of the Pokemon? Oh, don't make me get Pikachu on your ass. Of course they hold stronger than Superman. The madder the Hulk gets, the stronger he gets. Superman never gets mad. So I say, it's not <laughs> Frankenstein, you moron. It's Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> oh, by Cromlin, <laughs> you sure showed him. Eh. Battle Broad was a lot better when she had the Battle Broad Brigade. More battles, more broads. Hey guys, what's up? You seen the latest Spawn? It's really sweet. See, Satan tries to send Spawn to Hades, hey, but he's won't resist with all his superior strength. I ain't joking. <laughs> if you didn't work here, I'd plug that leaky dike of yours with my fist, but good. What can I say? I'm filled with the juices of life. Well, keep your damn juices inside already. That guy also <laughs> reminds me of a friend uh, who would buy Spawn and then, uh, after reading it, tell me everything that happened. <laughs> you have to tell you about his superior strength. And this is uh, long after I stopped reading Spawn, too. Okay. 
you know, I don't love the line, don't make me get Pikachu on your ass. It's kind of It's a corny. little like, these are funny yeah. new words we just learned. Yeah, but it was in 2001. People were thinking the P- the Pokemon craze was over. And uh, no, it's eternal. Nothing nothing goes away. Everything is always like, we, we got to see the last time Star Wars was not a thing constantly in like the mid-90s. Ever since then, everything stays all of the time. Especially if it was created near the end of the 20th century. Yep, yep, yep. I was thinking about this with regards to this, uh, the South Park guys, they loved Monty Python, but they're like if the Monty Python guys, instead of stopping after five seasons, did Monty Python every year, all of the time for 30 years when they met them. But now look, though, have I said that exact statement about why Hulk is definitely stronger than Superman? (laughs) And do I believe it in my core? Yes, I do. It's true. (laughs) Hulk has limitless power because the better he gets, the stronger he gets. Superman, though very strong, has a cap on his power because it is not defined by his rage. So you see, that's that's the difference. I truly believe that. (laughs) It's an unshaking core belief in me. (laughs) It sounds like it checks out to me. Personally, I I think very hard about that frankenstein joke constantly <laughs> yes yeah now now everybody knows that everybody well that guy's that. also describing a conversation that didn't happen yes that, that <laughs> yeah that's that, also, that definitely did not happen uh and uh by crom is an exclamation by conan the barbarian because he worships crom and uh yes yeah, so they're covered in uh, the juices of life and that's when they spot a certain something and why was it literally boba fett as it is in the comic well This is what Dorkin has to say, quote, somebody at Cartoon Network knew somebody at Lucasfilm and somehow it worked out and that was great. Boy, did that help. If we had to call it, bring me the head of made up guy, it just wouldn't be the same. It resonates that the show is about real pop culture. Even though we made up a lot of stuff like major violence or mushroom man, I wanted to get as much pop culture in there as possible. So it's grounded in reality. So the viewers would be like, oh, they're talking about real stuff. So. It wasn't Cartoon Network doing Clone Wars around this time or starting yeah, production? Yeah, the, the deal would have begun. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I, yeah, and I mean, this really shows uh, pre-prequels how fascinated nerds were with Boba Fett, this mysterious character yep. who is barely gets any presence. He's, he's offed pretty easily. There's a discussion as to if he dies or not, and now... It's been proven that nobody cares anymore because his (laughs) reputation has been soiled. Uh, He's the least popular guy in his own show. Everybody, uh, just to date this, listeners, we're talking about this before the finale of Book of Boba Fett season one. So there's some amazing thing in it that makes Boba Fett cool finally in this season. But in episodes uh, five and six, he is not a character. He doesn't say words. He's not in it. Like... Uh, but yes, this is back when Boba Fett was mysterious and cool and looked up to. And not a marketing tool Boy. for another show. Yes. Boy, yes. Boy, poor Tamira Morrison, who I like that guy, but he looks like someone's fat grandpa cosplaying as Boba Fett. Yeah, him in the same outfit. It wasn't made for a guy with the like, hey, when he, he was my age, he looked better than me. And I hope to just have somewhat of a paunch <laughs> by the time I'm in my 50s. So I don't want to talk shit about how he looks, but... Yes, the character of Boba Fett in that armor is not made for his body type. Like, it's just not. I've seen people online talking about uh, that show in ways that make me think they're trying to convince themselves to like it. (laughs) And one of the arguments I've seen a few times is like, well, yeah, it would just be so easy if they made a show about a cool bounty hunter. And my thought was, yeah, they should have done that. (laughs) That does sound easy. I guess, you know, if they did that, then he's just the Mandalorian, right? So Uh, it's like... I guess so, yeah. What if there were two bounty hunters that were cool? (laughs) Uh, but yes, this is back when Boba Fett was a cool guy who had like, I, I think, a cumulative 20 minutes of screen time and all but three of those was him doing nothing. And he was just he was made to be a toy. This is why people liked him, because he was supposed to be a cool toy. And he debuted in that uh, holiday special, right? He the did, cartoon. Yeah, which it's the only part of the holiday special that's on Disney Plus. They they decided to put that on there. But yes, uh, for the Eltingville types, they love this guy. They're not ruined yet by the prequels. Like Django Fett is just about to debut a couple months after this film com- or Oof. after this airs, which also ruins the mystique of Boba Fett. It's like, oh, Boba Fett's not one guy. He's the best clone of another guy who is every clone that fights who are the stormtroopers. Like it, it makes Boba Fett so uninteresting already there. And the price tag of this figure makes me think this has to be the 90s. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 I looked up what a real one of these gets you now. So a 12-inch in-box, though, not never open box, but an 
12 inch inbox from 77 or 79 is a thousand dollars one is on ebay for a thousand mm. i bet there's probably if it was a never open box i bet over two thousand oh absolutely yeah uh the one i looked up which was never removed from box was five thousand dollars oh boy but also to show you where nerdness is at like this was worth a lot to them then because they didn't make a ton of boba fett toys also like it was special because like wow the people who sell toys didn't yet really capitalize on the popularity of boba fett in the 20 years since this first aired, they have sold reproductions of this Boba Fett doll multiple times. So like are, $4.99. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, $80, actually. Oh, geez, but, okay. Yeah. As much as they're not allowed to draw other like actual things, they do actually do a good job on drawing this. Um, the box color isn't quite right, but the colors on the figure itself are, including like the antenna being flipped down and like the bracer things on his arm being different colors. And and the Wookiee like, scalps it, are there too. No, it's uh, I well, I also think probably getting the permission from Lucasfilm also came with this has to be very on model then if you're going to do this with our permission. <laughs> uh, but yes, Boba Fett is discovered. You like that, huh? I just got him in today. Never removed from box. It's so beyond mint, it's virginal. Wow. An original Kenner 12-inch Boba Fett in the Star Wars box. Wookie scalps and all. It's the stuff that dreams are made of. How much, Joe? Just tell me how much! Hey, no fair, Bill. I saw him first. I'm asking how much. You already got Han Solo and Chewbacca. Let me get somebody, you big greedo, you! But, Bill, if I get Boba Fett, he can bounty hunt my other guys. <laughs> they can fight! How much?! Rip them slobs off! Two hundred bucks! Tisk, 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 please. You could get 250 off these suckers easy. 300. <laughs> i now, love that henry this did make me think of you you tell a lot of action figure stories <laughs> uh -huh. and that you're building like elaborate adventures with different characters yes yes yeah no and he needs this for his fiction his his, yeah. his pretend fiction he's doing i uh that might be the line that is most me in josh's <laughs> mouth there yes that i was like well yes I, of course, need all the turtles and Shredder and two of the Foot Clan because then they can fight in the correct amount. Like, it's like, I can't. What? What? Is is Leo just supposed to go somewhere without Raph and Don? <laughs> like, that wouldn't make sense. He'll, he'll be lonely. <laughs> no, but, yes, I mean, it's a certain OCD craziness to be like, well, no, it has to be the complete sense. They, they have to fight. They can fight. Like, the excitement in Josh's voice when he's like, they can fight! Like, yes. I also sense some uh, resentment from uh, between Bill and Josh because Josh clearly might come from a higher station in life in terms of money, and Bill's got like a single mom raising him, yes. which could explain why Josh has all these figures already. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which also, again, is like, yeah, I was the boy with the most toys in my friend group from a, from a mother who uh, bought too many toys for me. So <laughs> I was yeah. raised by a single mom. I had one Raphael to my name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, that's... Uh, I I don't want to say me and you are bill and josh in this but no we have uh, much healthier relationship we're good friends yes <laughs> yeah but uh but yes they these two hate each other but also they're the only two people who can put up with each other that's what's depressing about it but uh yeah so begins the trivia off and uh in an age what strikes me in watching this is in an age of wikis and iPhones, it's crazy to me that like, well, Pete is the judge on it and they just trust that he knows all the answers too and he'll correct them, mm -hmm. which now it's just like, well, no, you can just look it up online. The way the trivia battle is, is settled in the comic is different than in the show. And in the comic, it actually does come down to a thing of what one guy knows as true but josh knows the more technically correct answer that <laughs> he has to run home and grab his book uh guide to prove it which now he could just pull up his phone and be like no look see i'm right it's this thing since my mom got a smartphone i've talked to her a lot less because she would call me <laughs> if she was having an argument with my stepdad she'd be like bobby who played that guy in that movie and i'd be like well it was this person oh see i told you wow well, yeah you're right that i I haven't had to do that as much with my mom either. Or I'd be yeah. like called downstairs during Final Jeopardy to be asked a question. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, what was that? You're right. But yeah. yeah. Boy, Bob, you got her smartphone just so you could talk to her less. Exactly. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, the trivia off is declared. That's how they'll decide who's going to buy it. 
Jerry says, BD, 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 I got a bad feeling about this, which is said by many a Star Wars character as uh, I've got a bad feeling about this. Quick question. How many of these answers did you guys know? Oh, I knew almost all of them. And I probably would have known almost all of them back then, too. Yeah, yeah. I uh, The ones I didn't know, like, I didn't see Westworld, so I didn't know Delos. Um, same here. Yeah. and Yeah, same. There's a couple of the, honestly, the only reason I know, I don't know Vulcan words and there are some deep cuts of uh, cult cinema that I only know because of Mystery Science Theater 3000, like the Metal U- Luna Mutant they bring up. Yeah, and Ray Dennis Steckler. And Ray I, Dennis I know Steckler, him yeah. because of that uh, the movie that, that was on MST3K, <laughs> the very long title movie. Uh, yeah, I knew like nine of them. But uh, the that's still not bad. I'd never seen Day of the Triffids. I didn't know that. And I didn't know Battlestar Galactic either. I knew the ants, because, but only because of the movie. And I had watched enough of the Impossibles that I knew Coil Man and Fluid Man, but <laughs> that one I knew too. <laughs> uh, and I also, in this whole sequence, I'm only going to play one clip from it, but you know, it does go on kind of long. It I does. Think. Yeah, yeah, that's like my one complaint. <laughs> but uh, and I knew Snowy, and I knew I, of course, would be the type of dweeb to say, uh, "I think you mean Tetsuan Adam." Excuse me, <laughs> it's not, it's not Astro Boy. I'd be that guy, but I give credit to Di Stefano as well that I think he laid out at least interesting new angles over and over again for what is really two static guys shouting at each other over and over how, again. How many comic pages is this? Uh, it is like six comic pages. It's very okay. long because I I love uh, I love Dorkin's layouts and his artwork and his comics, but I associate him with just very crowded panels, just like huge dialogue bubbles, and or... also with toys everywhere, yeah. and shit everywhere too. Yes, <laughs> but. Uh, but here, the trivia battle begins. Okay, guys, you know the rules. One question at a time, 30 seconds to answer, no hitting, no spitting, and no stupid crap like, what's Lucy Lawless's bra size? But I knew that one! As do all sad boys, Josh. <laughs> Bill, you stats and skinny challenged. You ready? Let's do it. Okay, what's Wedge's last name in Star Wars? <laughs> Get serious, Bill. What was I cloned yesterday? You think I just landed on this planet? No, because the impact would have killed us all. I'm just <laughs> warming up, okay? Now answer the damn question. Antilles! Name the theme park in Westworld. Ha! Delos! Who came up with the Silver Surfer? Duh! Jack Kirby, King of Comics! Who are the lizard men on Land of the Lost? Everyone knows that, you idiot! The Slee Stack! Name three kinds of kryptonite. Green, red, and gold. What rock star played on the Star Wars Christmas album? John Bon Jovi. Name two songs off it. R2-D2, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And what do you get a Wookiee for Christmas when he already has a comb? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those three types of crisp tonight. Green, of course, is poison. Red is an unpredictable one that transforms Superman into, say, an ant. And gold takes away his powers, sometimes uh, temporarily, other times permanently. Uh, and I think I've said literally on on podcast, Jack Kirby, King of Comics. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've said that. So, yeah, I mean, though, you know, not to look, he is the creator of it. But Stan Lee had a, I'd give him like 10 percent credit on on Silver Surfer. And also, if I was in this trivia battle, I actually would have said, oh, you're wrong. Stan Lee's co-creator. I win. Boom. Just boom. Josh lost right there. I do like the turnaround of name two songs off it. Yes, yeah, I like, and uh, which this is again before you just had YouTube that you could be like, "Hey, dude, check this out." Do you know there's a stupid Star Wars song about buying a Wookiee of Coke? You might have a cassette bootleg of it. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you you did have to work harder to, on this. I hate to be one and, of those guys like kids got it too easy, today. and it was worse. So that's it made you resentful. Yes, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I also think an, an unspoken thing here about how these guys know all this shit is because their toxic relationship is about constantly one upping each other on yeah. who knows the most trivia. So they're like, I have to memorize all this shit so I can prove another person wrong and be better than him in an argument, <laughs> which I wouldn't I, know I, anything about that or that kind of <laughs> feeling. The one question I kind of raised my eyebrow at was him asking what digimon evolved into what but then it's like well that would have been the big hot new thing after pokemon that just came out from japan so. oh yeah absolutely like fall of fall of 99 i think is when it hit american tvs yeah, right yeah. it was accurate for them though that was also one that i was like well i don't know that digimon's for kids <laughs> not like pokemon not like pokemon that's for everybody <laughs> yeah uh and of course uh i think the alex toth space ghost thing is a reference to that dorkin and dyer working on space or had worked on space ghost 
so there's a bunch of other stuff you also see that uh i really like that iron jaws like oh i can just steal some shit while these people are, are arguing <laughs> he's just stuffing stuff into his pants he's got those uh those jinko jeans <laughs> Uh, and of course, I know Oswald C. Cobblepot and all that stuff. And the Thundar thing, I only know because we did a Thundar one. Uh, I think it's really good animation on the full turnaround of both of their heads shouting at each other uh, in like half transparency over the Boba Fett. Like it's an ambitious animation pick again for just two guys yelling at each other for like four minutes. Yeah, I it, felt, it's I, awfully dynamic. I felt sorry for uh, sorry for Di Stefano because he had to do a lot with just a very talky scene, and I think every angle of that story is depicted. And then once he runs out of angles, it's like, well, let's put their faces on a stark black background <laughs> yes. and chop them in half and turn them into Boba. Uh, and uh, so here's how it ends in the comic in the comic they ask what was the english title for the film that was uh, most commonly known in america as godzilla versus the sea monster but josh answers it's ebira horror of the deep which was what it was called the first year of its release in america but then every other year after that it was called godzilla versus the sea monster and so I had had moments like that in my childhood of saying, no, you're wrong. I remember the specific one I had the, I, I actually had a, we're not friends anymore argument for a week with them on it, which is I said that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from 1990 was released by New Line Cinema. The other person said it was FHE because that was the title on the front of the VHS. I said, no, that's who put out the VHS, but New Line Cinema was the filmmaker. And uh, I, in early internet days, I looked it up and gave him a big I told you so, and <laughs> we didn't talk to each other for a few weeks, I think. <laughs> Well, look, Henry, the important thing is you were right. The reason I remember yeah. that is because I'm right. There were certainly times I was wrong, <laughs> but I don't remember those. <laughs> also, another addition in this is when the fight starts, the kids start chanting ECW, which w I also ECW. was like, yay! Uh, Extreme Championship Wrestling? Was that, right, is that from the era? From, well, like, ripped from the headlines? Yes and no. Well, unfortunately, that's where time catches up with you real fast. And But yes. If you were in Staten Island then and a hardcore nerdo, you also were into the smaller scale ECW. Like it was the punk rock thing. If you were into dingy bullshit, like all the other stuff, you love ECW. Sadly, from 1999 when they wrote it, by the time in 2002 when it aired, ECW had closed and been bought by Vince McMahon. So that ECW is no more. Weird looking rap bastard. <laughs> I wanted to bring up during this trivia contest, it made me remember a show I'd completely forgotten about, uh, Beat the Geeks. Right. That, that Comedy Central trivia show. And it aired like the entire span of it airing, Eltingville aired in the middle of that. And actually, I found out the other day the TV geek from that show follows me on Twitter. So Whoa. He, I think he's a listener. Oh, wow, man. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, he should know we're, we're similar uh, sad people. So <laughs> while, while this was airing, there was a show with like four Eltingville guys uh, on it as yeah. like the people you're fighting against. That was such a fun mix on that show because the TV geek and the movie geek were kind of similar dudes, but the record geek was a different type of geek who was like, oh, you like music. Pff, come on. But yes, uh, the trivia battle is lost in, I think, a better way than just him being technically incorrect about people disagreeing over title. This is better because it uses a callback to the first act. Concede this, you! ECW! ECW! Hey, hey, ECW, settle this ECW. like men! Bill, next question. Um, uh, who says beady, beady, beady? Jerry! <laughs> I, I mean Twinkie! Too late! Too late! You lose! You lose! <laughs> Tough luck, Josh. But I knew it! You all know I knew it! You're all against me, all of you! You anti-Semites! I ain't no anti-Semite. I got every Spielberg movie on tape. Josh, don't be a sore loser. I'm not a loser! You hear me? And this isn't over! Joe, do you hold items for customers? Uh, are you kidding? This ain't no storage space. Bill, do you have $300 on you? Are you stupid? You know I don't. Aha! <laughs> then I'm going home to get the money for my Boba Fett! <laughs> <laughs> His Boba Fett? Not if I get the money first! <laughs> Suddenly, I know what pity is. Huh. I, I love the twist that none of them have money, and it does bring me back <laughs> to those days because none of yeah, my friends and I didn't have any money, mm -hmm. 
our jobs paid us nothing and we spent it all on like anime DVDs and video games you and like the $5 menu at McDonald's. You wouldn't have $300 on you and you would have to rob your mom if that's, that's again, it's like, it is realistic, but also like you said, Bob, how do you root for these people that they're like, oh, well now it's time for them to steal from their mothers. Yeah. Like, just, uh, I, I do like Josh's voice actor. Like you just feel him just like waving his arms around and screaming and stamping in the recording. <laughs> yeah. He, he goes hard on it, man. And, and Jerry's right. He's a sore loser. You, you, you said the wrong thing, dude, you lost, but I see Jerry <laughs> level head on this guy. <laughs> I also like that. Uh, that Josh is, uh, he says everybody's anti-Semitic to him. And I feel like that Dorkin went through this in some time in his life when he said, I, I saw an interview with him where he's like, oh yeah, I saw a lot of anti-Semitism towards me because people didn't know I was Jewish sometimes. And then I would bet he has heard from friends who, you know, were bigoted towards Jewish people say like, Hey, I own every Spielberg movie. Like I'm not, I'm, I don't hate Jewish people. <laughs> I've certainly heard that to the degree of like, uh, excuse me, I watch lesbian pornography. I'm not a homophobe. Like, <laughs> I, I look at all my Asian <laughs> porn. I'm not racist. Like, yeah. But yes, so they run off. They, they got to both find their money. This is fun, dynamic action of running around. As they're running there, Josh says, then I'll see you in hell, which is, of course, what Han Solo says in Empire Strikes Back when he heads off into the cold and hot, searching after Luke Skywalker, hmm. as, you, as everybody knows. Them slap fighting each other reminded me a lot of Mission Hill when Andy and Kevin fight. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, it's it's like an indie comics vibe, and I was getting a lot of Mission Hill uh, Kevin vibes from this crew. I love the slap fighting, them bouncing off of people, like if that... That they're they're running over all of these people while just going to rob their mothers. Although I, I think Kevin and the rest of the Jolly Boys would be afraid of the Eltingville guys. Yes, yeah. The Eltingville guys are me and my most aggro, but more often I was like the uh <laughs> the, the the sad little scared boys of the Mission Hill. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh but, but so, voiced by Bill and Josh. Yep, yeah. They <laughs> so they head home. Bill is looking for mom's mad as hell money, which I'm not sure what that is. I mean, is it just a reference to network? Like, I'm mad as hell. I'm not well, going to take it anymore. Like, it, back in the day, uh, you would have, like, mad money stashed away, like, for oh. a rainy day. Like, you know, if I want to have a fun day and spend it, I have mad money. I see. So mad as hell money means his mom's not in a great place. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the things get darker with his mom in the comics, I will say. They have yeah. to. Uh, one of the things that breaks up the Eltingville ga Club is that bill does some shitty thing that costs her a bunch of money she's like i gotta move in with my sister now like this got bad like yeah it does oh, it does show you where they are because bill is stealing a checkbook his mom is probably floating a lot of checks around this time uh, when you can still do it and meanwhile josh has like seven credit cards he brings in it does yeah it shows their one well, their houses are nicer his josh's house is definitely nicer than bill's house too uh, we get one moment with his little sister who, yeah, she's watching an obscure horror film on TV and is trying to kill him uh, with a voodoo doll, which is just not working. I also like that uh, Josh uh, not just takes his mom's purse, but wears it over his shoulder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As she's asking if he's seen her purse. Yeah, Never heard yeah, of it. Never mom. heard of it. <laughs> so if I may do a very Josh thing here, Bill misquotes Phantasm. He says... You play a good game, boy, but the game is finished. I believe Bill says the game is done. Ooh. So, yep, in, incorrect there. He should have lost the trivia contest. <laughs> <laughs> if Josh wasn't so breathless, he probably would have corrected him there. But, <laughs> uh, but yes, then uh, Bill trips as uh, thanks to the voodoo doll being thrown. Josh starts screaming, tortoise beats hair, tortoise beats hair. Also, very accurately in the at the start of this clip, is arguing over whether Boba Fett was dead or not because that question had not been answered. Now we have the answer, and it's I. I wonder what these characters would think about the canonical answer of the that they have now. Probably they uh, would real, hate it, but watch all of it. I would think. Uh, real quick, uh, the expanded universe novels actually did say he didn't die from that. He flew out with his jetpack. <laughs> that's true, and the Dark Horse comics showed it as well. That's true, but but that's a certain level of canonicity. Like the comics and the books were one thing, but seeing it in motion that, that makes it more only because a corporation told you it was real. That's true. Yes, <laughs> that's why it matters. Back then, George Lucas via a corporation told me it was true. Now it's just a corporation mm -hmm. telling it, and there's no people involved. <laughs> uh but yes boba fett uh is fate is decided in this next clip 
It's obvious Boba Fett's dead, Pete. The Sarlacc belched. It ate him. Show me the body. No body, no death. Just like Freddy Krueger, Dr. Doom. <laughs> Get out of my way! I can't! I'm stuck in your fat! <laughs> Look, Joe, a check with your name on it! What am I, a bank? I don't take checks. Aha! Victory is mine! Credit cards, Joe! Credit cards! Take your pick! They're all good! I don't take credit cards, neither. What are you, a commie? <laughs> Everyone takes credit cards. You have to take those cards, Joe. You have to. Because I'm taking Boba Fett. Get your damn dirty paws off of him, you son of a... Very realistic breaking sound on that hair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it hurts. I wonder if they actually did break the head off of an action figure to do that. I like the very sleazy, low-key desperation in how Joe runs this business and that he can't float a check, but he also won't take credit cards. I know, yeah. Probably, well, I have I have known some shitty comic shops who are just like, now we're cash only. I ain't paying the money for a credit card machine. If there's any silver lining to the pandemic, it has broken all of the cash only stores where they're like, I guess we'll take credit. Fine. Yeah, yeah. They you all... know what? If I can get a Square Reader account, so can you. That's true. Yeah, we've we've done it ourselves. Or just say like, okay, I'll Venmo you right now. Just give me, give me this comic book. <laughs> There's other comics where Joe makes the point of like, there. Well, there are no other comic shops in town, so what are you what are you gonna do, loser? Like, not <laughs> buy them from me. There's dark jokes in it that the other comic shop in town closed down because uh, the owner of it was caught molesting children. Which, yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's. Uh, but yeah. So just like in the comic, it ends with them tearing the head off of it and breaking him. In the comic, they actually do have the cash live. I think it's better that in this way that technically they didn't spend their parents' money. It's more that they just owe Joe $300 because they didn't have the cash on him. But yes, they have destroyed Boba Fett and we come to our ending. But but he's no good to me dead. And you're no good to me alive. I can't believe <laughs> you broke your Boba Fett. Not me. You broke your Boba Fett. You did. You did. You did. Hey! Oh. You both broke it and you're both gonna pay for it. Please, Bill, I'm begging you, give me the head! Say goodbye, Josh. You'll never lay your sandwormy little hands on it. Wait, Bill, Bill, come back! I'll pay the rest of the money, Bill! Any kind of money! Sick money, even! Bill! Well, if Boba Fett wasn't dead before, he sure as hell is now. Oh my gosh, is this the end of the Eltingville Club? <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was yes it was. <laughs> he was correct you know what this also made me miss when you could have arguments about uh with friends of like well is this character dead is he not you know every question wasn't answered but also mm -hmm. unanswered questions weren't argued about all the time on twitter you know like <laughs> and and also every unanswered question wasn't then sold to you in a new thing like so it's just you know I got, like I said before, I got what I wanted and I don't like it. It's my world and it's hell now. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about the Adult Swim timeline and where this was in that uh, growing path of Adult Swim. So, yeah, the network starts in August of 2001 or September of 2001. And uh, this is sort of right after it starts, after the first big season where things are taking off. In January of 03, that is when Futurama starts on Adult uh, Swim. And soon after, Family Guy will follow. And I think they realize, like, we could make a show that costs as much as these. But instead, it's way cheaper to buy reruns and then make William Street, uh, you know, low budget stuff mm -hmm. that we own. Yep. But we don't want to do this. And then when Futurama disappeared, they're like, we got to make one of these. And I think that's how Rick and Morty came into being. That's when they finally had enough. They were just like, fine, we'll spend the money. We need one of these things. Yeah, this it was just it came at the wrong time. And also, I, I definitely think the Cartoon Network be, being counters didn't want to spend money on something a guy owned. 
Like in that I, too, yeah. And actually, you mentioned Family Guy, Bob. You you noted a uh, a Family Guy connection in this, or um, uh, a McFarland family connection in this. Oh production right, too. Uh, yes. production coordinator was. Uh, I, she has a different name now because she got married, but it's Rachel McFarland. Mm -hmm. And apparently, she was at Cartoon Network for a while. She had worked on shows with her brother as a production coordinator as well, like Johnny Bravo. Yeah, she uh, before Seth hit it big, she uh, came to L.A. And, and dropped out of college and worked with him on, on all these Cartoon Network things. And, you know, for the past uh, 17 years, she's been Haley on uh, American Dad and I think lives very well. And You know what? I think it's about to start its 19th season. Wow. 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 You know, wow. and good for it. Yeah. yeah. No, it is a better show than Family it's, Guy. So. It's been the better show than Family Guy since, I think, season three of American Dad. I think that's when they really hit their stride and they've, they've stayed as good and they still keep making new episodes for TBS. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Yeah. Season 19 just started in January of this Holy year. Holy cow, man. Unfortunately, this would be the end for the Eltingville club. We get to hear the Aquabet song over it. And, uh, I definitely love the, the chanting of there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with nothing us. Wrong with us. <laughs> uh, I feel that way, but, uh, but yes. And bill in the final, Eltingville comic, I won't spoil it for you, but they do call back to the head of Boba Fett in it uh, pretty well to uh, to mm. wrap up their stories. But uh, yeah, this was uh, a painful mirror to look <laughs> back at. And uh, <laughs> I like to think that I'm a better version of these guys now and that I would be the Jerry in the comics instead of the Josh who grew to be a more functional human being and dealt with my problems better instead of just being a rage filled person though again i must say josh's adult career was also my career when i was 29 <laughs> as well just he was working in comics press not games press so if fucking dorkin makes a new comic where all four of them have a podcast now then i will be once more supremely dunked upon by evan dorkin <laughs> but <laughs> yeah it was fun again i i had never seen it and convinced myself i had it's a very very fun and uh alienating time capsule of what it was like to be a nerd in the 90s but it, these guys are also probably like five or six years older than me. So it's like, what were the older boys up to? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, you know, I was of a different generation uh, when I was coming up. Uh, there was more of the anime, manga, video game people. It wasn't just sci-fi and comics mm -hmm. and Star Wars and stuff like that. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, a little too accurate to uh, <laughs> nerd culture of that time. And even if even though it was like a lot nicer than the comic was, it was a lot more uh, cleaned up. If those guys were a little younger, they'd know they wouldn't need to buy a tape of cut together nude scenes to for to get their jollies. They could just watch the dirtiest animes, you know? Absolutely. Get the legs of that. And all those girls are in college, so don't worry about it. <laughs> they said it themselves. This, <laughs> you know, colleges in Japan look like high schools. Big they, brother, <laughs> I just got back from college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, a gas can. Do you? What are your final thoughts? I just, I had a lot of fun watching it, and I think part of it is because I. Evan Dorgan does he does come from the perfect place to satirize something, which is that he loves it, but he can also see what's wrong with it. And that's that's where I think a lot of media that kind of makes fun of dweebs and gamers and stuff now kind of gets wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I think is the best version of this now? They're not doing any more, but Red Letter Media's Nerd Crew. Yes, yes, that, that is, is perfect. Perfect because they're uh, it's the it's the flip side of this where they're not aggro. They have to be nice and like everything, and I think that's where we are right now. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Now I miss the Nerd Crew. I think they did a joke on a recent one about how they're like, "Ah, we ran it into the ground. Like there's there's nothing more to do with the Nerd Crew." <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, uh, this uh, was a great trip back in time, uh, Professor Gaskin. So thank you very much for for picking this one. Yes, uh, thank you. Pick. Yes, uh, you're welcome. It, and it has been very nostalgic, if not if not for the specific geek stuff, but just me remembering what my own life was like <laughs> on the early internet and stuff back then. It made me happy to be alive in the year 2022 and also to have a wife. <laughs> yes, yeah, same for me, but with a husband, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and now I actually have the money to do a hobby like this, but I don't because I just don't have the space or energy for it. Now, replace Boba Fett's with Simpson cells, and I also, uh, <laughs> I'm still doing that, <laughs> but hey. <laughs> Thanks again, Professor Gascam, for being on the show. Do you have anything you want to plug? Do you want people to find you online? Do you want to plug someone else's work? Uh, please let us know. Uh, I kind of prefer being anonymous online, actually. That's <laughs> My okay. life has been happier for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
But well, all right. Well, then we appreciate you picking this. I'll I'll just say that then you know what? Check out Evan Dorkin's Patreon. You know that guy. He's he could always use the money. It's tough being an independent comic artist uh, in your fifties. I've I've learned from Evan Dorkin on Twitter. <laughs> So thanks again to Professor Gascan for being on the show. If you want to be a cool patron like him and get all these episodes one week at a time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. When you sign up for five bucks, you get just that, but also access to everything behind me. Five dollar paywall that includes over 100 miniseries episodes alongside regular access to monthly episodes of Talking Futurama and Talk King of the Hill. There is a $10 level as well when you sign up for that yellow $5 stuff naturally, but also access to one Megalon podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Bob is talking about the What a Cartoon Movie podcast. You see it every month in your free feed of this What a Cartoon podcast, but we cover an animated feature film just as in-depth as we do failed adult swim pilots like Welcome to Eltingville. Recent ones have included the Disney Golden Age classic Pinocchio, the 1999 South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut film, Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, and I'm sure we're doing a really cool one this month, but we're recording this so far in advance, we don't know what it is. There is a giant back catalog, I'd say over 230 hours worth of what a cartoon movie is at the $10 level. In addition to all that $5 stuff Bob mentioned, we cover everything from a goofy movie to akira if you got every reference in this episode of eltingville then i think you'll enjoy our super very in-depth discussion of those films check it all out at patreon.com slash talking simpsons so i've been one of your hosts bob Mackey. you can find me on twitter as bob servo and my other podcast is retronauts the classic gaming podcast about old video games find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts for access to two full-length bonus episodes every month and henry how about you you can find me on twitter at h-e-n-e-r-e-y-g stay up to date on my many josh like takes there uh also you can follow on twitter the official twitter account of this podcast and sister podcast talking simpsons at talk simpsons pod at talk simpsons pod keeps you up to date when new stuff goes up on the patreon or on the free feeds or if we have anything cool going on in our lives as well you should check out the official website talking simpsons podcast.com if you're looking for an easy to view full back catalog of all of our free podcasts they're at talking simpsons podcast.com Thank you so much for listening, folks. We'll see you again next time for our extended free preview of May's episode of What a Cartoon Movie, and we'll see you then. Welcome to Eltingville. We are the comic book air. Science fiction, horror, fantasy, and rolling club. Made it protectors, super collectors. The Eltingville Club, the Eltingville Club. Welcome to Eltingville. We'll spend most money on major violence, boogie school, and no true me. There's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us. The Eltingville Club, the Eltingville Club. Toys, cars, games, models, toys, cars, games, movies, toys, cars, games, monsters, Elton Bell Well, forget it, Josh. He's mine. You leave me no choice, Bill. I challenge you to a trivia off. Trivia off? Oh, trivia off? Oh, boy, oh, boy, Trivia off. Trivia off. Trivia. What do you trivia say, off. Bill? Trivia a trivia off? off. Winner trivia takes off. Fett? Bring it on, fat boy. Trivia Boba Fett is as good as on my shelf. I got a bad feeling about this, Buck. Trivia.